Good morning, everybody. Nothing like the smell of justice in the morning. How are y'all? Hey, Trilindo. Yes, we will have the live feed here every day. Big thank you to Beth for gifting a membership. Appreciate that. Let's do this. Feels weird not being there, but I'm hoping to go next week. Appreciate that, Terry. Can you guys see and hear me? Give me a thumbs up. Because I've got it running on two computers for this stream, and I don't know if I am actually live. Okay, good. All right, so I'm on. Fruit Loop just texted me. You know, your stream is Pacific. Glad she texted me. I wasn't going to hop on, but the feed's not up yet, so I thought we could just sit and chit-chat for a minute. What do you guys think? I'm excited to see this come to a close for everybody involved and get at least Idaho out of the way. We still got Arizona to go in the case that keeps on giving, but never thought we'd get here. I don't know if I'll believe it until openings actually start that's how i was last year sitting waiting for Lori's openings i was like well, what's gonna happen something's gonna happen this isn't just gonna start and then it did and it finished so it was pretty cool what are you guys most excited to learn about this this trial i think for Lori's trial they didn't have to bring in everything that they had on chad because they just needed enough to convict Lori. So I think they've got some stuff up their sleeve that we don't know yet. And I think it's really going to start to fill in those puzzle pieces of what we don't know. Thank you, Harley. Appreciate that. Wow. I appreciate that. Thank you very much. Um, I want to know phone pings, location data, text messages, all the stuff they got from the electronics. Thank you again, Harley. I really appreciate that. Yeah, Fruit Loop says she's on. Everybody say hey to Fruit Loop. The other half of Pretty Lies, she's doing good things with The Hiding Place, their domestic violence safe haven. You can find them online at Channel Missions. Give them a look. They're doing some amazing stuff up there, saving lives every day with domestic violence victims. Yeah, but everybody, thank you, everybody, for thanking Harley. And also we had um, Beth gift uh, membership. So thank you guys. It helps me to do what I do every day. I think we're going to learn a lot more about Tammy Daybell's murder. That's going to be one of the key things because that was in his home. That was him by himself with that. And then with Lori, it was conspiracy. So I was actually, that was the one charge. I wasn't sure that the jury would necessarily find Lori guilty on because it was really circumstantial, but they did. And I think it was clear the whole story fit together that, of course, she would be in on this. But that was the one charge that we were all a little like, mm, might might be the one that hangs them up, but we were wrong. Thank you so much, Warrior Princess. Uh, so I think with Chad, we're going to learn, I want to know where his phone was at key times. And then you think about the search warrants that they executed at the house. Uh, journals. I mean, there's all kinds of stuff in there. I think that a lot of people think this is going to be the same trial, and I just don't think it is. I think it's going to be different in a lot of different ways. So, oh, thanks, FM. Um, good to see everybody. Pittsburgh, we got Atlanta. Everybody in Louisiana, be careful. There's some tornadoes. If you're in the path of storms, um, there are several live people on YouTube that will tell you down to the street where these things are going. We're getting it from 4 a.m. to 10 tomorrow, 10 a.m. And I have a dog that's 80 pounds that's terrified and he will end up in my bed shaking like a leaf and keep me awake. Get, don't get drunker than Cooter Brown. All right, Cooter. Can't, uh, that's a, that is such a Southern saying, drunker than Cooter Brown. And then as the crow flies, that's like from point A to point B. If I had to say from here to, um, the store as the crow flies is five. Eliza, yeah, this is the first trial I've live streamed. Go figure. Um, 
we, me and Fruit Loop launched this podcast on this case the day they found the kids' bodies. If you don't know this story, we had been following this case since it hit the news in December, and we started sleuthing everybody right off the bat, finding things before it was taken down way back in December. We had a lot of insight into the main players in this case, and we talked about a podcast. It was during COVID. Hatch Brown, appreciate you. Um, and so when I saw Nate Eaton in the helicopter, Fruit Loop at that time lived five minutes from me. And we we just hung out all through COVID. We've been best friends since high school. She's Aunt Fruit Loop to my kids. I was like, get over here. Nate Eaton is flying over this property. There's backhoes. Something's going down. And we couldn't fathom that we would find these kids' bodies. Thank you, Cheryl. Um, so we go live with an internal iMac computer speaker and we run back in the closet because it's a little closed in the audio was horrible and we just sort of fumbled our way through as the news broke that day that they had found the kids bodies and we had seven listeners that day and then we just started deep diving this case as it progressed so this case is very near and dear to my heart i've grown to love Kay and larry like family and so for them i'm ready for this to be over and you think about it you, you know, I, I've been doing this kind of refresher course to get everybody ready. And we get so caught up in the drama of Chad and their texts and Lori. And I was laying in bed last night trying to fall asleep. And I'm thinking, you sit back and remove all that and think about the horror of what was found in Chad's backyard. Two children. One, I rewatched the testimony last night of when they found the remains in June, 2020. And you forget the very vivid descriptions of what was uncovered. And it, it just brings it home that you can take away all this hoopla between Lori and Chad and Storm and you're my goddess and all that. And this is about two kids that were brutally murdered and thrown into the ground. It, it, it brings it home. And it's like days like today, you kind of got to pump yourself up because that's why we're here. You know, we're not here to look at Chad or see how many times he blinks, although that is a fun game. But yeah, I'm just, thank you, Barb. I've just been thinking lately um, how sometimes th the years roll past and we sometimes need to be reminded why. And last night was one of those moments for me where it was like, holy moly. This, I mean, you stop and think about what that man did what Alex did, what Lori did. It, it is one of the worst cases I've ever seen in my life. So uh, thank you, KS. Appreciate you. Yeah, Pat, I tweeted out the Thunder Rolls today and I just put, if you know, you know. Okay, so can I tell you guys when I was sitting in her trial last year and that came out, we're sitting there. I'm sitting next to Brian Inton and I think Lauren Mathias. I'm like, you know, in the middle. And the guy on the stand hesitates when the state's like, can you explain to us what the storm is? And the, like his little cheeks get red and he's kind of like, here it goes. Got to do it. Got to do it. I'm on the stand. And when they say it, y'all, I have the sense of humor of a 13 year old boy. So it was really bad for me. I was having to bite my tongue and just, I was like, try not to laugh. And I was like, please don't let judge Boyce look at me. And I'm trying not to laugh. Like I'm in middle school and I think he looked at me and I was like, oh my gosh, he's going to kick me out of here. It was so awkward. And the jury was like, really? What? What? It was crazy. France. We got France. Wait, wait, wait. We got France in the house. It's so awesome to see where everybody's from. So I'm trying to see if I can get up there next week. I'll be up there at least a couple of times, two or three times. Um, I'm thinking maybe next week is what I'm shooting for. We'll see. Um, yeah, Warrior. And it, that's the thing is that these are just kids. And, you know, you have Charles, you have Tammy. And then I always think about poor Tammy. Not, not only what happened to this beautiful sweetheart of a woman, it seems. The fact that for really over a month, she lived in that house not knowing what was in her backyard. And that haunts me because Tammy Daybell was a librarian. She loved kids. Um, I mean, and, and it just, it, it's so egregious. And 
Yeah. So I'm all for some justice. And, I, you know, going through all this for the, the refresher course, you forget so many things. But I really do think this trial is going to have its own dynamic separate from Lori's. Um, they didn't have Lori on the property. And so I think we're going to learn a lot more about DNA evidence that was found in that barn. Because, and just a trigger warning, but this is just part of the case, you have Tylee who was dismembered and burned. And the condition of her remains, the FBI agent on the stand said it was, in other words, kind of something they had never seen or something that's not common. Um, and, and you think about, I totally lost my train of thought. Let me take another sip of coffee. What was I saying? Holy moly. Oh. But it, it's like, where did that happen? Where, I mean, it wasn't in the townhomes. The forensics unit at the townhomes found no biological evidence whatsoever in those homes. The dismemberment had to take place somewhere. And I, the only place I see is Chad's barn because we had the pickaxe and the shovel with Tylee's DNA on it in there. Then you think about how did how did you hide that? Because when I was at the fence last year, I went July 30th, the day before her sentencing in Rexburg. I remember standing there and I was live and I actually just reposted that live I did where I drove from the townhomes to Chad's property. And I, I drive up and Shanley Painter from Court TV's out there and then more people come up. But the distance from the fire pit to the road is not far. And not only that, there are several houses that have a line of sight to that fire pit. So, and we know they buried her that day because you have that overhead shot of his yard and you see that disturbed ground right there at the fire pit. They literally buried Tylee in broad daylight because Alex got over there uh, nine or 10 o'clock in the morning, kind of escaping me. But the brazenness of it. And then you have JJ's, which by all indications, it looks like the professional grave digger dug the grave in advance because you had tree roots that were cut and ready to go. And that was also the shortest time that Alex was on that property. I'm going to put my phone on Do Not Disturb. My ringtones are real music. And then YouTube will kick me off if I'm playing music. So and there's so many things. But I think we're going to learn a lot more about that physical evidence in that house. It's just going to be different. And with Lori, you know, you had John Pryor attending at pretty much every day or every other day. He was there at least a couple of times a week, maybe more, having a front row seat to this trial. So I just don't think that the prosecution really threw all their cards on the table with everything they have because then you're giving Pryor a heads up of what your strategy might be or what you're going to use with Chad. So I just think it's going to be very different, and we, we'll see. Um, right, and, and Ramblin' Rome has a good point. Who would have ever thought that's what they were doing, even if you were standing in your backyard looking at them? And I think that, you know, yeah, who would have thought you had that search warrant in January, and you see the video and the pictures, there's snow on the ground, they're using um, metal detectors to try to find projectiles. And all the while, these kids are a football field, if not less away from where they're searching. And it's just very eerie. And then you have that video of Larry where he was on, I think he was on camera when he said this, where wouldn't it be something if those kids were right here, not knowing that that's where they were? It, it, it blows my mind every time. Chad, I don't think Chad has a chance either, Rebecca. It's, I sat through that trial last year. This was Lori's trial, but there was enough evidence in Lori's trial to totally convict Chad, in my opinion. You might see little animals coming in out of the frame. I have a cat door over here, and they like to come in. And if you see me wincing in pain, you know one of the cats is treating my foot like a chew toy or a play toy. Um, hey, Pat, that's a big compliment. Thank you so much. Um, I'll be doing a lunchtime live today on Law and Crime Network, as soon as they go to lunch, you guys hop over to Law and Crime, and we're going to do an hour-long just Q&A. We're going to have some people on the panel. It's going to be really fun, kind of like last year, except I'm home, which uh, with this trial streaming, it's a lot easier for me just to be here and do what I do, And um, but I, I will be going up.
and I'll be doing a lot of live stuff from up there. But um, Chad will blame Lori. That's another thing I think we're all waiting to see is I think he's going to throw her under the bus and back over her one more time for good measure. Uh, but I think that's coming because unlike Lori, Chad, Chad's, you know, Lori did not let her attorneys do their work. She wouldn't let them throw Chad under the bus. She wouldn't let them throw Alex under the bus. Mental health couldn't come in. So their hands were tied. And I'm just going to say it. Her attorneys and her investigator, Brandon, very nice guys. They are just fun to hang around with. They are good people. But, Lord, you know, defense attorneys are human. And thank goodness we have them because, you know, until we need one, we're kind of like, by default, they're the enemy. But Pryor is more theatrical. And I think that, it's going to make for a more interesting trial as well. More objections, more fire under his pants because Chad's allowing him to do that. And I think that Chad will mount the defense that will, in his mind, get him acquitted, which is it was all Lori. But when you read through these text messages, it was to me, it was fire and gasoline. They each kind of rotated being the, um, being the one in charge. So I just feel like it's really a 50-50 thing. But throwing people under the bus is what you do when your life's on the line. And this is a death penalty case. So his life is on the line. I wonder if Lori's going to follow this. I know in a lot of jails, they have court TV. The uh, contact, uh, me and Fruit Loop started a series called A Glimpse at Life. And it's a contact I have from childhood who is serving life in prison for murder and she's been very open and honest and given us a, a big inside look into a first timer with no prior criminal charges. What it's like to go from being a free citizen to being life in prison without parole. And one of the things that they sit and watch all day in prison is court TV or law and crime network. They get law and crime where she's at. But you have to wonder, is Lori going to be following this case? If she has a tablet, those don't connect to the internet like ours do. It's very um, controlled, those tablets that they have in prison. But they can get podcasts. Um, I checked, and it looks just like our little Apple podcast. And they can pretty much get most podcasts that are out there on those tablets. At least that's my understanding. You have to, you have to assume she's going to be watching this trial. I miss Fruit Loop, too. I tell you, uh, not only do I miss her on here, um, hey, Patricia, don't worry about that. I'm just glad you're here. Um, she lives an hour away from me now, but, you know, it's it was all meant to be that uh, the property that they house these women on, that they are headquartered at, came up at the right time, and it was too perfect. So they have women and children up there. They house men victims off-site. And my daughter, my oldest, she's graduating next month high school. And she's been helping out up there. And through Fruit Loop and Brianne kind of nurturing her in this field, she's decided she wants to be a trauma counselor for children. So it's like they've planted seeds for the time they've been up and running that's extending beyond victims. It's extending to my daughter who wants to make a difference in kids' lives. So I, I just channel missions. Fruit Loop, we're going to have her on a few times during this trial since we started this podcast on this trial. It's only appropriate. We finish out this case together, and we did with Valo too. So Arizona, go visit Lori. Yeah, and then some people... Um, some people think, is she going to be called? And I think what prior, I haven't watched it, but he gave an interview which kind of resulted in this gag order that Judge Boyce extended just yesterday um, where I, I think, did he, in, did anybody see it where he indicates, Fruit Loop is there under channel missions. That's Fruit Loop. Did anybody see that prior indicated there was a chance he may call Lori? Because I haven't looked into it and I don't want to sit here and talk like I know what I'm talking about. Trying to keep an eye on Judge Boyce's YouTube. It doesn't start for a little less than an hour. I'll knock off about 20 minutes before to get ready. I got to crack my knuckles and I'll do an hour-long recap tonight of all the testimonies today. I do it in an hour or less. So if you can't watch all day or you don't want to watch, uh, come to me this evening. Might be a little later getting these out because they're two hours behind me. But when I was there, I was getting them out at 3 and 4 in the morning because my internet stunk at my Airbnb. 
and I would get 98% uploaded and then I'd have to start over. So I think probably by nine o'clock, we'll have that daily recap out. And then every day that I'm not on um, Law and Crime, we'll do a live lunchtime here and just hang out because I love it. Look, Fruit Loop, you getting like a rock star welcome. Okay, Grammy, thanks. I Maybe it was just a... Um, Maybe it was just a something I read, somebody wishing. But I think he might have referenced it. Neil, I will be going up periodically. Since it's streaming right now, I've got um, one graduating high school next month. I have my youngest. She's in seventh grade, and she is running varsity track. Uh, Grammy's back's hurting a lot, so... It's easy for me since it's streaming, but your girl will be up there, uh, I, I would say, at least two or three times throughout the duration. And watch something come down during CrimeCon. We're all going to be in Nashville for CrimeCon, and then we might get verdict, and everybody hops on a flight after it's over to go up to Boise. Um, good morning, Shirley. I got my coffee. I'm ready to go. It's going to be, uh, my blood type's going to be medium roast today, probably for the next 10 weeks. The one thing I was known for at trial was coming in with my big Yeti full of coffee. And then at lunch, my camera guy had a big Stanley, like the OG your grandpa used to carry, and he filled me up. Coffee. Um, uh, Mikhail, if, let's just say in a, in a, I don't know with her appeals going on too, if that's something that, that she would even be able to do. But I mean, they they would they would probably bring her to Idaho for that, I would assume. So uh, thanks, Jean. Appreciate you guys. Hey, Chewy, Hash Brown, Chewy, Michelle, Steffi. We've got a lot of good mods in here, and and I uh, just want to thank everybody. We got Lilo. Um, Michelle will be coming in soon. Just a big thanks to these. Cheryl, big thanks to these guys because they spend their day making sure this chat runs smoothly. If I'm away and the feed goes bad, they're right there to pick it up. So big shout out to the mods. I've, I've ordered them a goodie bag that should be there soon. If, you, if you're a mod, by the way, and you have not, uh, email me your address, gg at prettyliesandalibis.net. Shoot that my way. I got something for you because what Steffi's here, what you do is um, very selfless work and it's all part of the big cause for justice. So thank you. We got Hash Brown, Chewy, you guys rock. Thank you so much. Mods are bombs. It's just another way to support justice. So I love it. So what do you guys want to talk about while we're waiting on this to start? I'm hoping I'm able to switch back over to that feed seamlessly. So let's cross our fingers. I think I will. Jamaica. Oh, Tracy, can I come stay with you? I need some vitamin C. I've got some chat. Uh, let's see. I got some chat here to look at. I've got some... Um, Let's see, I'm making sure I'm getting all these. Um, appreciate you so much, Barb. Kansas City, go Chiefs. I've been a Chiefs fan before Travis Kelsey, although I'm a Swifty. Just going to put that out there. But I do love the Chiefs. I had a listener send me and Fruit Loop both a Yeti Chiefs cup, and I have used that thing every day. I like college football, though. It's, a, you know, for me, it's just go Tigers, Clemson. Hey, Wells. Welsh girl, you know what was in my memories today? Uh, me in Port Isaac in Cornwall with my youngest. Um, are we doing an over under on Chad testifying? Don't see it happening in a million years, but um, hey, appreciate you. Where are they? Uh, for those of you that are YouTube members, I'm working on some really cool emojis. I'll be doing some YouTube shorts. We have a Discord. They'll be putting that link in the chat. I'm I'm still learning how to use Discord. Um, Chad will absolutely throw Lori under the bus and Alex as well. I do anticipate that. Chad has death. And that is, even though Idaho really doesn't execute a lot, although recently I think they did or it failed, um, his life's on the line. So I think in his mind, he has to understand that they're never going to be back the way they were. This is over. It, it ended the day she was arrested. And that at this point, it's really him for himself. And I don't think he's going to reciprocate Lori's stance of, I'm not going to throw my husband under the bus. 
you have family from Greenville. Greenville's awesome, Welsh girl. It is such a cool little town. I love it. The memberships are $4.99. And really what it is, I had a lot of people say, you know, I shoot you a super chat every now and then. Can we have memberships where we have fun little emojis and, you know, we have messages that we can just talk in a Discord. So I just threw it up there. It's one one fee, $4.99, and it's um, just a way for me to keep doing what what I do here. It's, it is expensive to run a podcast. We have a lot of things we have to subscribe to every month, but it's not, you know, I'm not going to be one of those that pushes this every five minutes either. If you see it, you see it. Um, oh, Sandy, same. Sandy says, I would love to be a fly on the, on the prison wall when she sees him turn on her. It's going to be a big piece of humble pie. And I think that uh, that's going to be difficult for her. Um, you know, when, when we were at sentencing, and, and Lori is a person that I think is a very interesting psychological study now and way down the road in that you could not have sat in that room with her reading that statement and not say it's, you know, there is something wrong with her. her. She is detached from reality. But at the same time, Lori covered everything up. Thank you, Laura. You don't hide when you are totally incompetent. So if Lori really 150% believed in everything they were teaching, the day Charles Vallow was shot and killed, Lori would have went to the police station and said, yep, we killed him. He was Ned Schneider. He was a demon. We did the world a favor. Same with J.J., Tylee, and Tammy. Instead, she made up these elaborate stories that were lies to get law enforcement off of her. Now, they weren't, and they, they weren't that stupid. Thank you, Welsh girl. But you can be mentally ill and be competent at the same time, and that is Lori Vallow. Chad's never claimed any kind of uh, mental illness, although I'm curious to see if his two near-death experiences in the water come in later, if he's found guilty, and we get into the penalty phase, is that going to be a mitigating factor? Oh, he had a head injury. You know, they start to pull that stuff out. So I'm interested to see if we get there, what will happen. Um, Harper, what time is it in England now? I can tell you this is starting in 45 minutes. Uh, so that's pretty, whatever time you're at, add 45, and that's when we go live. Oh, is it Calico Cat Mom? I'm in Los Angeles. Been watching you ever since Scott Reich talked about your channel. Went over, got a chance to view, to view you and Fruit Loop doing coverage of this case. I miss Scott Reich. I haven't talked to him in a while. I need to say hi. He's not much of a prophet if he didn't see this coming. See, that's my joke, too. It's like, man, they, they get visions, but they sure didn't get visions. Then on Chad's blog, he writes that his spirit guides or whatever help him avoid trouble in the future. And I'm like, whoa, I didn't see Lori Vallow coming. Uh, Gene, yeah, it, it was a belly flop. He had a, a little boo-boo on his back, like a little gauze on his back. And But they're going to, the, I, I, I wouldn't be surprised if they don't bring in that uh, aspect of it for mitigation. Thank you, Shirley. Scott Reich is a good, good guy. We have a good podcasting uh, community as a whole with all the different people out there. Lauren Mathias, um, you know, you just got so many good people out there. And what I love is that we can all be covering this case. And if you watch everybody's episode, everybody's take is different. You know, what people bring to the table is different. You've got Nate Eaton there who's been just fantastic with his coverage last week at jury selection, his lives at night. I watch him every night, check him out. You got Justin Lum, who just did that really big documentary style special on this. If you haven't watched it, do yourself a favor. With somebody like Justin and Nate putting these things out, they've they've lived this case for four years. I think Justin Lum was on this case the day Charles was shot or shortly after. And I think there's just a little bit more heart in there with people like Nate and Justin who have watched this unfold over all these years. And um, it's interesting how the victims become somewhat a part of you because you've told their story for years and you feel like you know them. It's very bizarre. Charlie Adelson, yeah. So I've got to finish some series. One, oh, by the way, before I get there, one thing. On the slideshow, there was a date that was wrong for JJ. 
And what your girl did is we had these banners printed for sentencing last year. And I think Kay or Janine texted me and said the date I had done a typo doing his, um, his date. Thank you so much, Susan. And we corrected it so that it was on the fence correctly. But I posted in the slideshow the date uh, of the photo where somebody was like, yeah, you typoed this. And so, sorry. My bad. Close to 400 thumbs up. Thank you, guys. You know, when you guys about spilt coffee all on my lap, y'all, you'd have heard me hit the high note if I did that. Amsterdam. Um, there's a chance I'm coming to London next month, Magnolia. And that is somewhere my daughter and I are thinking about hopping over to. If I do, we'll have to meet up for some coffee. Thank you, Rosemary. I appreciate it. Crush is doing a live. Oh, I I got to meet Crush in person last year. I love her. Um, the Justin Lum special. Let me throw that uh, link in here. You guys have to watch it. Um, um, it was something about remorse. Um, sorry, I'm typing. If I can spell Phoenix right. I'm on cup number two. I need like five before I'm firing on all synapses. Glory of Valo. Uh, it's called No Remorse. The Let's see. Let me get the actual link. I'm going to copy that and put that in chat here. It's about 45 minutes. And um, man, the tone of the whole thing was just sets the tone, the darkness. I'm hoping my Airbnb that I stayed at last year is... Um, is available again. I got to know my neighbors a bit. Thank you, Laura. Jen is a new member. We got Where Are They? We got Lilo Gifted. Barb. Thank you. Cheryl. Hash Brown. I love that name. It makes me want some Waffle House. Some cheesy eggs. By the way, I'm working on a cheesy eggs breakfast club t-shirt for everybody. And after trial, I'm going to hand that over to Lindsay Blake. And tell her, I want your cheesy eggs recipe. If you watch jury selection, that was an analogy they used. Thank you, Pamela. Angela, Pamela, Sandra, and Rita. Hey, Michael. So don't forget, lunchtime, as soon as they break for lunch, hop over to Law and Crime on YouTube. We'll be going live. I think Jesse Weber is going to be on with me. And not sure who else, but we always have a great panel. And... Oh, it's raining men outside. Hallelujah. Oh, Shelly, thank you so much. So what else are you guys wanting to learn about? While y'all are typing that in, somebody asked me the other day, what do I think is the most powerful testimony that came out of the trial last year, aside from like FBI and, and things that were technical? And I said, hands down, the phone call with Summer Shiflet. Uh, that was, um, thank you, Shelly. Thank you, Leslie. Appreciate you, Bert. Barrett, is it Barrett? Why is this not showing? Oh, wait. Oh, come back. Oh, did I take my trash out? I hear the trash bin. Thank you so much, Barrett. That's very kind of you. Thank you all. Appreciate it. Um, we'll see. The jail call with Colby Ryan. Yeah, those jail calls just really hit a different way because you've got two people that knew and loved Tylee and JJ and 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 they they find out we've been lied to. She fooled us. And, you know, Lori, um, anybody who, you know, is there's such a thing in the true crime community where we say, oh, she was never a good mother. And looking back, looking through the Joe Ryan custody documents, which actually came up at her bond hearing, I think in Hawaii, where the prosecutor talks about her defying court orders way back when she was still in the custody battle with Joe Ryan, which I loved because all of that essentially went unchecked. Joe Ryan fought. He tried to see Tylee, tried to be in her life, and Lori was just blocking him at every turn. I loved how that came back in. But I would have loved to have been a fly on the wall when... She found out she was not the beneficiary. Can you imagine that one? I can just see her like flailing her arms and oh, poor me. Um, 
Kimmy, um, I don't think Chad would. Lori, she's on my JPay. Have you guys heard the story of how Lori Vallow scammed me out of some JPay uh, stamps? So on JPay, which is a lot of the where she's at, that's what she uses in Idaho. And so it's a messaging app. You can do FaceTimes, you can do voice calls, or you can email. So in order to email, you have to buy stamps. And then each email is a stamp. And then you can gift the, the inmate stamps so they can write you back. I hadn't opened JPay in a while because my contacts started using it. So I was actually going in trying to see if I could cash out my stamps that I bought where we were doing this Jail to Life series. Well, I have three messages from Lori Vallow on there, y'all. And um, it's kind of a pre-written, like a copy. I'm going to try to pull it up. A copy and paste where it says my media funds are low. Um, and I was, so I had these stamps that I couldn't use. Okay, so look here. This is my email inbox for JPay right there. Lori Vallow, I had three. This one was October 30th. So I said, well, I'm not going to use these stamps. I was going to hop on and see. So I talked to a couple people close to the case and made sure it was okay and said, all right, I'll send her some stamps. So I emailed her a little introduction. She remembered me from the trial last year. And I was like, you know, wanting to find out some things like, what's up with Chad? Although, to be honest, you guys, I was not going to put it on here. I was not going to sit here and go back and say what she was telling me. But I got, I talked to some people and they were like, yeah, that's cool. And she took the stamps and never responded. Never had Lori Vallow scamming me from solitary confinement on my bingo card for last year. But here we are. Funny story. And I've got to talk to uh, Lauren Mathias because apparently she said something to somebody. Lori Vallow said something about specifically messaging me. And I got to find out what it is. Um. Uh, do you think Arizona will go into Lori's false child abuse claims of Joe Ryan on Tylee Ryan? I don't think so because that it's just Charles was involved in that custody battle. Um, you know, Charles was told Lori's version when you're married, you're going to believe that person. Uh, but it really doesn't have, a, it, it may, <sighs> the only thing that might come in is the tasing incident on Alex Cox. But even then, um, I don't think much will come in about Joe Ryan, unfortunately. And his case has been closed. And although um, I'll always have my opinions on that one. Um, in minutes, uh, we have 35 minutes, Kitty, until court starts. So in about 15, I'm going to switch over to the feed, make sure we've got that up and ready to go when it starts and get my fingers ready for a day of Lots of typing. My keyboard, you can't see it, but the 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 keys are smooth because I've typed so much. Um, I have to admit I'm worried about the verdict. I think the recording of Summer and Colby really helped the jury. I doubt it'll be played at Chad's trial. I don't think so. That was really that was Lori's family. I don't worry about the jury. I think that um, after sitting through it last year and then seeing the jury's reaction when things that were specific to Chad were brought up, how it really looks bad for him. You got to consider we're going to, these jurors are going to see these very graphic, very graphic crime scene photos. And I mean, look, I worked in a morgue and, uh, Oh, Greenville in the house. Hey neighbor, I'm kind of near Furman. Um, it, it's just going to be different. There's just going to be things that are very specific to Chad and the things that were played in court, like the, or shown in court, like what they did is when the FBI did the search warrant that day in June and found the kids' bodies, they had a Faro scanner, which is that it's, it's kind of like what you see somebody on the side of the road. This is a surveyor and it takes 360, like thousands of photos and data points and it makes it into just essentially the crime scene as it was the jury can see before they start at the end of the first day, the next day, blah, blah, you know, on and on. They showed progressions of unearthing the remains of Tylee. They showed a progression of photos of unearthing JJ all the way up to the medical examiner's office. For Tammy Daybell, they showed the photos in the home of her in the bed. Then they showed the same kind of progression when they exhumed her body. 
So we literally saw the grave hasn't been touched. Everybody standing around, breaking ground, breaching the vault, you know, getting to the coffin all the way, loading up to the autopsy. Those things, um, I worked in a morgue for a couple of years. I worked on the donor team. I'd take corneas out for people that were donating corneas for transplant. And, uh, oh, thank you so much. May Is it Mabel? That was my grandmother, my great-grandmother's name. Those are powerful. And I that day, I was 30 seconds from going live on Chris Cuomo, standing in front of the courthouse, Chanley Painter's catty corner to me, and I get sick. I pull the mic off and I just go in a corner and I'm like, first of all, I'm like, please, God, don't let there be any surveillance cameras watching this because you just don't want people to see it. But it was so disturbing to me and somebody who has seen the worst kind of deaths work in that job years ago that it really, it just after court was over that day and we all just sort of started processing what we have seen. I, I mean, I got sick. Um it, it's haunting. I can see it with my eyes open, and I'm not usually that way. Um, so there are some powerful things this jury is going to see. Juries are unpredictable. We know that. We've seen cases where it's like, oh, yeah, it's a guilty, and then hung jury, not guilty, whatever. But I'm not worried, like, for a half a second about Chad and the outcome of this trial, just on a personal, my opinion, level. Although the justice system has to work, and we got to go through the process, and he should get a fair trial. Thank you, Vintage. Welcome aboard. I'm going to be working on some perks for our memberships. Amy, yeah. And, I, you know, you have to wonder, is it a situation where would that be the thing that really kind of breaks that wall down for her when she sees that Chad, her partner in other creations on many planets, is like, yeah, it was her. I'm going to save myself. I think that would be... um now, if Lori were a free woman, Chad should fear for his life because Lori's just no holds barred. But with her behind bars, she's probably just going to throw a little tantrum in her cell and curse him and all that stuff. Um, I'm not sure. Uh, yeah, definitely, Rosie. I believe Melanie Gibb was, was that first week. I think she was really quickly after we started, but they could start with Tammy Daybell's murder. I think really maybe the first few days we might see similar witnesses setting up what the jury is going to need to know because this jury, according to what they answered in court, they don't know. Thank you, Michelle. They don't know a lot about this case. And if they do know, they don't know a whole lot of details. So the story that we've all known for nearly four years now or over four years, um, a lot of these people don't know. And there were times where we had one juror who filled up about 12 notebooks throughout the course of this trial. Um, and, and so it gets very confusing for them. And you could see that on their faces in those early days of testimony where we've had years to know the ins and outs. And these people are learning all this. And you know, when you try to explain this case to somebody, it's like, okay, just brace yourself and it'll all make sense in the end. And uh, and then they're like, it doesn't make sense. I don't get who's who. A lot of players, the, they've got to lay that foundation down to be able to build this 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 case in front of that jury. So I think I think the first few days might be a repeat of some of the uh, some of the the first ones we saw in Lori's trial. But we'll see. Maybe they're going to totally shake it up and go go right in. Powdersville, love Powdersville. I was just there last week for my uh, daughter's. Track meet. Thank you, KS. Powdersville is a great little community. Um, it's really quiet and you got a little lamb beside you. Salt Lake. I flew into Salt Lake. It was gorgeous. But yeah, and I mean, that, that that is so true. And Anna, Lori could totally just um, say, oh, he, this is for the better part of the mission. This is... He's taking one for the team or, you know, I'll take one for the team being the, the bad guy. Um, right, Patty. That's that's true. I think if, you know, if all you have to do is go back and listen to the allocution statement. She is. Thank you, Bernie. Um, she is. Um, yeah, there's a disconnect for sure. What was the most shocking thing you learned observing Lori's trial? 
some of the text messages um, that we went through, you know, not even 24 hours after Tammy was murdered, you have Chad and Lori texting lovey-dovey stuff. Chad saying, I'm sad, but not for the reason that people think. I think stuff like that is going to be so powerful for this jury to see your wife died 20 hours ago and you're telling Lori, I can't wait to hold you. I want to snuggle up with you, blah, blah, blah. It, it's, it, it tells the story. That the story tells itself with these text messages. Things like that were little things we didn't know. They're not little things, but we got a lot of stuff with the Chandler document dump. Thank you, Fiona that answered a lot of questions years ago that was pretty unique because it was that separate investigation in Arizona, but it did bleed into the case of the missing kids and Tammy's murder and Charles's murder. We had the, the documents from the attempt on Brandon, then the Chandler documents with, um, uh, is that Artie's? Thank you so much. Appreciate you. Four years later. Yeah. I mean, talk about the long road to justice, but, um, it's going to be, it's going to be big going to be huge landrum julie rowe that that was something i was wondering as well leslie because chad literally told julie rowe on separate occasions he, that tammy was going to die so i wouldn't be surprised if if julie rowe isn't on that stand i have not seen a witness list i guess it was sealed or i missed it but um Tiger Lily, that's a question we all want to know at his arraignment i think two or three of his kids came I have heard maybe, and, and this is just something that was told to me, maybe one or two don't support him as much, but I'm very interested to see if they will be there. I wish I were there so I could see these little things, but um, it'll be interesting to see who shows up for Chad. You have to wonder how he feels seeing, I'm sure Tammy's sister is going to be in there. Tammy's aunt has been in there. Um, Kay and Larry are in there, but... It's it's different, you know, I think when your family, like the people, your in-laws that you spent years, decades with, uh, every life turn, marriage, birth, everything, um, now you're the defendant for taking their loved one away. Uh, you have to wonder, Chad just is nervous, and we saw that from Lori's trial when they approach him on the day of the um, of the welfare check. You know, Alex kind of looks at Chad when they say, where's JJ? And then Chad's like, yeah, I kind of know Lori. Um, and then Lori's like, yeah, he's a friend of my brother's. And they were married. And the investigators knew this. They're like, okay, you don't have her number, but we know you're married. Chad just didn't know. Uh, Chad's nervous. If you look when she gets served in Hawaii for the order to produce the kids, uh, Lori just kind of takes it and is like, why are you bothering me? And Chad is just inching closer. Like, sticking his neck out like a giraffe trying to read the paper. Um, and then you had Melanie Gibbs say that when he called her the day of the welfare check and told her, don't answer the phone, he was very nervous. When Lori called, it was the opposite. She was cool as a cucumber. Uh, Christine, this is starting in 25 minutes. My shirt, yeah, I have, um, so I have like literally all like 70 Pink Floyd shirts. I have over 200 band shirts. Every concert, Australia. Welcome, welcome. Um, there's no way Alex was, um, just happened to fall over the day after Tammy Daybell. He went to Mexico that week and got prescription medication because it was cheaper. Look, I mean, the the toxicology, they re that, they, I think they reopened that or they, no, that was Joe Ryan where they reopened. But with Alex, it, you know, it looked like, Clots to the lungs, but I'm sure there's something you could take that might send you on your journey that maybe is hard to, I don't know. And then maybe it's just his cold, callous, evil heart um, or the stress of knowing game's up. I mean, it very well could be that he knew when they exhumed Tammy Daybell, that was it. I hope Chad's kids see the truth. I feel for Chad's kids, I'm going to tell you, because... None of these families asked to be thrown into this case, which they're grieving on a worldwide stage. You've got people judging everybody in this case, families, defendants, family. Um, and so however they support their dad, it's 
I always say if, if, of course, kids are in the yard and your mom, I, so it baffles me a bit, but I also see when you're raised by somebody that's your father, you, you can't fathom he would be involved. But there was a side of Chad I don't think any of his family knew about. I don't think Tammy knew half of what was going on, and that's just my personal opinion. Um, but ultimately, exactly, um, like Amy says, justice for Tammy and the children, that's why we're here. Um, Barcelona. I'm going to come to Barcelona so bad. I'm in a travel mood. Um, right, and Lil Miz, that's the thing, is it, it, it's hard to remember what stuff has been sealed. And so this is it. This is the last trial for this, this, these murders. And so I really do think we will get a lot of those missing puzzle pieces through electronics, especially. And, you know, we'll see. You have to wonder what they got. Oh, nice. I saw them in 94 at Clemson University on the Division Bell Tour, their last tour. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I wouldn't be surprised, you know, uh, that Tammy knew a little bit about his crazy beliefs. I just don't know that she would be into the zombie stuff. I mean, it's it's so far-fetched. Alaska, what's going on? Right, Slay. So you got this dude in ill-fitting plaid shirts and khakis pulled up past his belly button and a buzz cut in living rooms with an audience of maybe 10. And I think a lot of people believe some of what he said. You had that core group. I called them a band of misfits with Melanie's, Gib, um, Alex, that just, you know, I was the brother of Jesus. And they were like, whoa. I'd have been like, dude. Like, that's not right. But, um, you know, I've heard that there was a bigger following in a more general sense and not involved than we would ever imagine. And that's scary, you know, but I, I, I had some back and forth. Thank you, Kimber, with a, with a cult leader last year just reached out to me and um, or he was in a cult. And then kind of became sort of it wasn't a cult. We would know it was just like a little band of misfits. But he said, I can take anybody no matter what demographic, no matter your social status, your financial status, give me a month and I can have you believing anything I want you to believe. And I was like, oh, you're not going to have me believing it. And he's like, that's that's literally the first thing everybody says. And then a month later, I look and, you know, it's like, so yeah, it's very interesting. I think that if you look at Zulema and Melanie Gibb and Alex, it doesn't seem like they all were firmly grounded in anything. And I think that they were looking for that one group that they identify with. And unfortunately, it ends up being maniacs who don't think twice about killing four people. Um, you know, you noticed last year on the in the trial, a lot of your key witnesses really wanted to minimize their involvement, but it's there for everybody to see. You have Zulema, who is talking about... Um, when they made the move to Rexburg and Zulema says, uh, Alex asked, or Zulema asked how the trip was. And Zulema says, um, asked how the trip was. And Alex says, fine, except for the porter, the portal. Thank you, Tammy, that uh, we brought with us, the dark portal or something to that effect. And he says, highly. And he asked if she can call in a tornado. And she says, maybe an inner tornado. And then she says, I think you'll be led to deal with the dark one when it's time. But then to see somebody on the stand really try to minimize, well, I, you know, I thought that they were right because this is stuff so sacred. Why would you lie about it? But it's, there's a lot of backtracking with that. And it always, for me, it's like, no, we, we, got, we, got, we got evidence that this was not a surprise. I, I think that's right, Slay. I think she did. I think, you know, she had this group. And that's, for me, that's kind of, you know, Alex was an oddball. And um, Zulema, you know, it's just, um, well, yeah, those text messages are huge. And not only that, they were very out of character for how they normally communicated. So, 
that's going to be a big deal. And, and like I say, I think this barn is going to be a treasure trove of evidence directly against Chad as far as this potentially was where Tylee was dismembered. And those kind of things, you can't clean up enough. I did the Chandler Halderson case. There were two killed and dismembered in his home. And you can, and look, cops walked through initially and didn't see anything that was alarming, even down in the basement where it was happening. But when you get in there with luminol, you get in there and you find fragments everywhere or whatever, you never fully clean it up. And I think that's going to be one thing we learn about, which is just heartbreaking and devastating. And, and another powerful moment, I think, in the trial last year was when they showed Tylee's necklace and her charm in that fire pit. The, I think the chain was in the fire pit. The charm was just outside of the fire pit. And then they showed that photo of Tylee wearing that necklace. That was a big, just, you know, it was one of those things that just reiterates this precious, you know, innocent kid just at the mercy of maniacs. It's true, Slay. You know, uh, you got to stand for something or you fall for anything. And I think that's really a good way to sum up the main players in this case. But that that necklace stuck out to me. Would they offer Zulema a plea deal for all the days? She clearly knows more. I think Zulema has um, some type of immunity. I don't want to speak if it's like limited. I don't know. But Essentially, the reason we didn't see Melanie Zulema or Melanie Gibb charged, in my opinion, a lot of this case was electronic. You had a lot of proof. You do have the DNA side at Chad's house, but and the bodies in the yard and all the very obvious things. But the premeditation really kind of rolled out in these documents. And I think that that the lack of anything direct between Gibb, Melanie, and Zulema as far as a direct plan, Zulema was just essentially using Harry Potter magic to try to kill Charles, which isn't a crime, unfortunately, because her intention was that what she was doing would directly result in Charles's death, but it's not a crime. And so um, I think if they had anything on the three of them, their testimony to solidify these convictions against Lori and hopefully Chad, it's just more beneficial then what little time they would serve probably be in nonviolent offenders or uh, Melanie's had that one record for trespassing, but none of the others had records. So what would they get like probation? We would rather have their testimony. That's going to make sure the two main players go away forever. So I get that at the end of the day, though, it's hard to think after reading through these texts and the new ones we read last year uh, or that were read out in court. Um, but I, I just feel like it, ultimately the testimony was needed more than what little time they might have got with what they had in electronics. Because you see people know things, but then there's that gray line of if you know a crime's going to happen, is it actually a crime for that they could charge you with? And and I don't. Nobody indicated. I think Brandon. Well, Melanie really indicated she knew Brandon was going to be shot at or had been shot at. That was one thing, but she's got her own thing going with that. I think there's some, uh, she broke into some computers or looked at some accounts and that's still pending out there in Arizona. Let's see if Judge Boyce's feed is up so we can mosey on over there. And, um, but I'll try to do this every morning while we're waiting instead of everybody just chatting. Oh, we're up. So here's what I'm going to do I'm going to switch over to my other computer. We are going to switch to the live feed. Don't forget, lunchtime, hop over to Law & Crime on YouTube or probably on the network. I'll be in and out of chat. I'm going to be making my notes for the episode, so um, I'll pop in when I can. I'm not ignoring y'all. I'm going to put this on the screen until I get this switched over. So thank y'all for chatting. That was so much fun. We'll do it every day. And then on the days where I'm not with Law & Crime at lunch, we're going to go live. We're going to chit-chat for the whole hour. All right, we'll see you soon. I guess I could take my camera off because when I get up, y'all going to see my yoga pants. Wait, there we go. Right there.
Thank you. Please be seated. All right, good morning, everyone. We're on the record now on Fremont County case CR 22211623, State of Idaho versus Chad Guy Abel. Let me confirm with our uh, tech people and clerks here is the broadcast on. Yes, Thank you. Uh, the court will note that as we get started, there is a courtroom conduct order in effect that you've all been advised. Please pay attention to. The terms of that order, including making sure you don't have any devices that would go off and interrupt proceedings, no recording within this courtroom or photography of any type. The court is providing public access through the open proceedings as well as the live stream that's being conducted. With the court's live stream, we have, I think, good technology in place to accomplish that. Uh, if something comes up that interrupts the live broadcast of this trial, and this will be throughout the trial, uh, we'll give an opportunity to try to get that started again. However, if there's going to be any kind of significant delay in the live stream broadcast, the court will be continuing on with the proceedings. So there may be gaps in that, but uh, I think our technology is in place that hopefully that won't occur. But just so those listening in understand, if it does come up, we likely will not pause the trial longer than necessary to uh, make that accommodation. At this time, uh, I'll note also for the benefit of counsel, we do have all 18 jurors, our 12 jurors with six alternates have arrived this morning, and everyone has submitted their juror affirmation sheet regarding following the court's admonishment while they've been gone. No issues to bring up on the affirmations of the jurors. So with that in mind, then let me go to the state and the state is here present as the state ready to proceed this morning. Yes, Your Honor, thank you. Thank you, is the defense ready to proceed? Yes, Your Honor, thank you. Okay, thanks, counsel. All right, before we bring the jurors in, uh, which we'll do very shortly here, I also, as we are getting started and before the jurors are sworn and we take evidence, is there, I believe we've already had a motion to exclude witnesses. Let me just clarify on the record is there going to be a motion to exclude witnesses through evidence portion of the trial made by the defense? Yes, Your Honor. Very well. Uh, the court will reaffirm them. There has been a motion to exclude witnesses. So, as the state begins with its case in chief, keep that in mind that uh, they are not permitted to observe the trial proceedings, including the live stream. Uh, the only exception would be for a witness. If they statutorily qualify as a victim, then they are permitted to observe the proceedings. So, each witness is going to be questioned whether or not they've observed any trial proceedings, and I would instruct. Uh, the state and then follow the defense if they have witnesses to make sure that the exclusionary rule is followed. Does the state have any questions on that matter? Your Honor, the state would just clarify and just make counsel in the court aware. It's the state's understanding that through the Constitution and statutorily, victims have a right to remain in the courtroom throughout the proceedings, regardless of whether or not they are victims. And we have discussed that uh, with defense counsel and made the court aware of who we think there may be a crossover with, um, meaning individuals that may be present and also witnesses, but statutorily they would have the right to be here. So including any of the defendant's children, as well as since they were Cammy's children, as well as um, siblings, sometimes grandparents. The court made a ruling last year in the Lori Ballow case. I think if we're following a similar guideline, those are the individuals that we would just note for the record may be present at times, but should have the right to be present throughout the proceedings. In addition, I would just note for the record that we do have our case agent who will be present for the duration of the trial. 
duration of the proceedings. And that's Chief Deputy Vince Kaikamani. Okay, and the state's permitted their case agent as it relates to victims. Uh, the court agrees they are permitted to see the proceedings, including if they are a witness. Uh, we would take up on a witness by witness basis whether or not they fall within the statutory qualifications permitting that. And I know the state's aware of the issue. Uh, we'll make rulings tested as to whether or not they would qualify and later call to testify. Uh, Mr. Pryor from the defense, any further comment or questions on the exclusionary ruling? Nothing further. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, Mr. Pryor, thank you. All right, this time then we will have the jurors brought in. Yes, sir. All rise. Oh, the jury's present. Thank you, All right. Thank you, Mr. Bale. Please be seated. All right. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen of the jury. We're on the record on Fremont County case CR 22211623, State of Idaho versus Chad Guy Abel. We're ready to proceed with opening arguments and initial instructions this morning to you as jurors. The court notes that the prosecution is present as well as the defendant and the defense attorney representing him as well. We have qualified this panel of 18 jurors consisting of our 12 jurors with six alternates. And they are now seated for trial. Let me start with the state and ask will the state agree that the jury has now been properly seated and ready to be sworn? Yes, Your Honor. Thank you. Will the defense agree as well? Yes, Your Honor. Thank you. All right, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, thank you for returning this morning. You're now seated as jurors in the case before us. As previously been told, um, I'm Stephen W. Boyce, the district judge of Fremont County in charge of this courtroom trial. I'll briefly reintroduce you to some of our uh, court personnel assisting here today. Shannon Holstein, seated to my right, is the clerk who is keeping minutes of the trial proceedings, will be marking trial exhibits and administering oaths to you as jurors and to the witnesses. Uh, we do have our courtroom bailiffs as well to assist with keeping order in the courtroom and helping the jury move about where they're supposed to throughout the day and then enforcing any conduct orders we have in effect here for the trial. Our um, court reporter today, Amy Bland, is taking a stenographic record of everything said during the trial proceedings. And my staff attorney, Courtney Stallings, seated to the far right, who assists me with legal research and administrative matters that come up throughout each day of trial. Each one of you has been qualified, examined, and selected to serve as a juror of this court. The clerk will now have a roll call of our seated jurors. Please, Madam Clerk, if you would conduct the roll call. As to each juror, once your juror number, is announced, please just uh, indicate present or here verbally so we acknowledge that on the record. Um, Madam Clerk. Sure, Second. Sure, 219. Here. Here. 
1277. Here. Here. 1278. Here. 1272. Thank you, Madam Clerk. This case has been brought by the state of Idaho, sometimes referred to the state as the prosecution. State is here represented in this trial by Lindsay Blake, the Fremont County Prosecutor. Ms. Blake, could you please stand briefly? Also, uh, Rob Wood is the Madison County Prosecutor. Ingrid Beatty is a Special Assistant Prosecutor. And Rocky Wixom is a Fremont County Deputy Prosecutor. The defendant in this case, Mr. Daybell, is represented by his attorney, John Carter. Thank you, Counsel. In a few moments, the clerk will read you a redacted version of the amended indictment in this case. That document is not to be considered as evidence. It sets forth the charges against the defendant. You must not consider it as evidence of guilt and not be influenced by the fact that charges have been filed. Mr. Daybell has pled not guilty to the charges contained in the amended indictment. And please remember, again, it's a description of charges. It is not evidence. Under our law and system of justice, every defendant is presumed to be innocent. This means two things. First, the state has the burden of proving the defendant guilty. The state has that burden throughout the trial. The defendant is never required to prove his innocence, nor does the defendant ever have to produce any evidence at all. Second, the state must prove the alleged crimes beyond a reasonable doubt a reasonable doubt is not a mere possible or imaginary doubt. It is a doubt based on reason and common sense. It may arise from a careful and impartial consideration of all the evidence or from a lack of evidence. Mm -hmm. If after considering all the evidence, you have a reasonable doubt about the defendant's guilt, you must find the defendant not guilty. The duty of the jury is to determine the facts and then apply the law set forth in the instructions I will later give you to those facts. In this way, you will decide the case. In applying the court's instructions as to the controlling law, you must follow those instructions regardless of your opinion of what the law is or what the law should be or what any lawyer may state the law to be. During this course of the trial, including um, opening statements, you're instructed that you are not to discuss this case among yourselves or with anyone else including using the internet or social media or any other form of communication, electronic or otherwise, do not conduct any personal investigation or look up any information from any source, including the internet, and do not form an opinion as to the merits of the case until after the case has been submitted to you for your determination. The court's given you that instruction now multiple times, and I will continue to give you that instruction uh, and again, that's not because I don't think you're not paying attention. Uh, it's just uh, important enough. We'll keep reiterating that. And I will note we received the juror affirmations today from each of the jurors indicating they have followed that instruction. So thank you for that. At this time, then, uh, the next matter we'll take up is to have this jury placed under oath for trial. At this time, then, Madam Clerk, if you're ready to administer the oath, I'll have the jurors stand and be placed under oath. When you stand, then please raise your right hands. You solemnly swear or affirm that you will try the cause now on trial and a true verdict rendered here and according to the law and the evidence. So I'll do that. All right, thank you. Please be seated. <laughs> All right, the jurors have already been advised uh, of some of our trial procedures in this case, and I'll just give you some additional general information here. Our normal schedule is to run trial from 8.30 each day until 3.30. At times that will need to be modified for certain reasons. Sometimes we have matters to be argued outside of your presence. Sometimes uh, during the recesses, they may seem to go long because we're conducting other court business outside of your presence. But we will take recesses uh, through the morning and also in the afternoon. If anyone is uncomfortable, needs a break or recess for some specific reason, 
please notify the bailiff and we'll do our best to accommodate each of you and keep you comfortable while you're here. In addition, if anyone has any kind of accommodations they need, for example, assistance with a hearing device, uh, other matters, please notify the bailiff again. And we want to make sure you are as comfortable as you can be and able to uh, be alert and attentive throughout the presentation of evidence in the case. These seats that you have been uh, assigned to at this time will be your specific seat throughout the trial. Please return to that same assigned seat each day or after each break so that we are able to determine who's here and someone's not for some reason who's not here. Um, if there are interruptions at times during the trial, I know that can be frustrating, but we'll work our best to keep those to a minimum, move the trial as long as efficiently as possible, but at times it just uh, takes time to hear motions that are necessary outside of your presence. And then the uh, courtroom and your location for deliberations, as well as during the trial where you'll be held, we've provided uh, of course, access to restrooms and other needs you may have. Uh, I'll address your compensation here. State law allows you for $10 a day for your jury service. However, after five days, that bumps up to $40 a day. So uh, this trial is expected to go some time. You'll likely get into that increased range of compensation and that's pursuant to item code 2215. You're also entitled, I believe, to a mileage reimbursement for travel each day. And that can further be explained to you if you have any questions. Um, also, you may notice from time to time or a lot of the time I'm looking at monitors here during the trial. I do have case information here and availability to access and research things from the bench. And so uh, if you notice me looking at those monitors, it's generally to assist me in uh, trial issues that come up. At this time, then the court will provide the jury with some additional jury instructions. As I read through these, it's somewhat lengthy. Um, and I will notify that you don't have to necessarily memorize everything I'm saying from the trial is concluded and you deliberate, you will have printed copies of these instructions to return to for reference. And if you'll give me just a moment here, I have a brief inquiry to make with my staff attorney. All right, thank you. Now that you've been sworn as jurors to try this case, I'll go over with you what will be happening. I will describe how the trial will be conducted and what we, what we will be doing. At the end of the trial, I'll give you more detailed guidance on how you are to reach your decision. Because the state has the burden of proof, it goes first. After the state's opening statement, the defense may make an opening statement or may wait until the state has presented its case. The state will offer evidence that it says will support the charges against the defendant. The defense may then present evidence that is not required to do so. If the defense does present evidence, the state may then present rebuttal evidence. This is evidence offered to answer the defense's evidence. After you have heard all of the evidence, I'll give you additional instructions on the law. After you've heard the instructions, the state and the defense will each be given time for closing arguments. In their closing arguments, they will summarize the evidence to help you understand how it relates to the law. Just as the opening statements are not evidence, neither are the closing arguments. After the closing arguments, you will leave the courtroom together and make your decision. During your deliberations, you will have with you my instructions, the exhibits admitted into evidence, and any notes taken by you in court. The defendant is charged by the state of Idaho with a violation of law. The charges against the defendant are contained in the amended indictment. The amended indictment is simply a description of the charges. It is not evidence.
Jury instruction number three. The defendant, Chad Guy Daybell, has been charged in the amended indictment with certain counts of entering into a conspiracy with Lori Bell Daybell and or Alex Cox and or other co-conspirators. The crime of conspiracy involves an agreement by two or more persons to commit a crime. You must only consider the evidence against the defendant, Chad Guy Daybell, in this case, and should not speculate as to any other case or legal proceedings involving any alleged co-conspirators. You must remember that the defendant, Chad Guy Daybell, has the presumption of innocence, and you must consider his guilt or innocence based solely on the evidence provided in this case. Instruction number four, it is alleged that the crimes charged were committed on or about or on or between a certain date. If you find a crime was committed, the proof need not show that it was committed on that precise date. Instruction number five. Under our law and system of justice, the defendant is presumed to be innocent. Presumption of innocence means two things. First, the state has the burden of proving the defendant guilty. The state has that burden throughout the trial. The defendant is never required to prove his innocence, nor does the defendant ever have to produce any evidence at all. Second, the state must prove the alleged crime beyond a reasonable doubt. A reasonable doubt is not a mere possible or imaginary doubt. It is a doubt based on reason and common sense. It may arise from a careful and impartial consideration of all the evidence or from lack of evidence. If after considering all the evidence you have a reasonable doubt about the defendant's guilt, you must find the defendant not guilty. Jury instruction number six. A defendant in a criminal trial has a constitutional right not to be compelled to testify. The decision whether to testify is left to the defendant acting with the advice and assistance of the defendant's lawyer. You must not draw any inference of guilt from the fact that the defendant may not testify, nor should this fact be discussed by you or enter into your deliberations in any way. Jury instruction number seven. If during the trial, I may say or do anything which suggests to you that I am inclined to favor the claims or positions of any party, you will not permit yourself to be influenced by any such suggestion. I will not express nor intend to express, nor will I intend to intimate any opinion as to which witnesses are or are not worthy of belief, what facts are or are not established, or what inferences should be drawn from the evidence. If any expression of mine seems to indicate an opinion relating to any of these matters, I will instruct you to disregard it. Jury instruction number eight. Your duties are to determine the facts, to apply the law, set forth in my instructions to those facts, and in this way to decide the case. In doing so, you must follow my instructions regardless of your own opinion of what the law is or should be, or what either side may state the law to be. You must consider them as a whole, not picking out one and disregarding others. The order in which the instructions are given has no significance as to their relative importance. The law requires that your decision be made solely upon the evidence before you. Neither sympathy nor prejudice should influence you in your deliberations. Faithful performance by you of these duties is vital to the administration of justice. In determining the facts, you may consider only the evidence admitted in this trial. This evidence consists of the testimony of the witnesses, the exhibits offered and received, and any stipulated or admitted facts. The production of evidence in court is governed by rules of law. At times during the trial, an objection may be made to, question, to a question asked a witness or to a witness's answer or to an exhibit. This simply means I'm being asked to decide a particular rule of law. Arguments on the admissibility of evidence are designed to aid the court and are not to be considered by you nor affect your deliberations. If I sustain an objection to a question or to an exhibit, the witness may not answer the question or the exhibit may not be considered. Do not attempt to guess what the answer might have been or what the exhibit might have shown. Similarly, if I tell you not to consider a particular statement or exhibit, you should put it out of your mind and not refer to it or rely on it in your later deliberations. 
during the trial. I may have to talk with the parties about the rules of law, which should apply to this case. Sometimes that will occur over on the corner there. And we do have a device here that uh, lights out the noise, so you can't hear us speaking there. At other times, I'll excuse you from the courtroom so that you can be comfortable while we work out the problems with evidence. You are not to speculate about any such discussions. They are necessary from time to time to help the trial run more smoothly. Some of you have probably heard the terms circumstantial evidence, direct evidence, and hearsay evidence. Do not be concerned with these terms. You are to consider all the evidence admitted in this trial. However, the law does not require you to believe all of the evidence. As the sole judges of the facts, you must determine what evidence you believe and what weight you attach to it. There is no magical formula by which one may evaluate testimony. You bring with you to this courtroom all the experience and background of your lives. In your everyday affairs, you determine for yourselves whom you believe, what you believe, and how much weight you attach to what you are told. The same considerations that you use in your everyday dealings and making these decisions are the considerations which you must apply in your deliberations. In deciding what you believe, do not make your decisions simply because more witnesses may have testified one way than the other. Your role is to think about the testimony of each witness you heard and decide how much you believe of what the witness had to say. A witness who has special knowledge in a particular matter may give an opinion on that matter. In determining the weight to be given such an opinion, you should consider the qualifications and credibility of the witness and the reasons given for the opinion. You are not bound by such opinion. Give it the weight, if any, to which you deem it entitled. During instruction number nine, at the conclusion of the trial, you will decide as to each charge whether the state has proved the defendant guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. The subject of penalty or punishment is not to be discussed or considered by you in making these decisions. That is a matter which must not in any way affect your verdict. During instruction number 10, the state is seeking the death penalty in this case. If the defendant is convicted of murder in the first degree, there will then be a separate sentencing phase of the trial. At that sentencing phase, additional evidence may be presented and the jury will be given additional instructions. At the conclusion of that hearing, the jury will then decide if the defendant will be sentenced to death. If the jury decides that the defendant will not be sentenced to death, either the defendant will be sentenced to a term of life imprisonment without the possibility of parole, or the judge will sentence the defendant to a term of life imprisonment during which the defendant could not be paroled for at least 10 years and possibly for life. Jury instruction number 11. If you wish, you may take notes to help you remember what witnesses said. If you do take notes, please keep them to yourself until after you and your fellow jurors go to the jury room to decide the case. You should not let note-taking distract you so that you do not hear other answers by witnesses. When you leave at night, you'll leave your notes here with the videos. If you do not take notes, you should rely on your own memory of what was said and not be overly influenced by the notes of other jurors. In addition, you cannot assign one person the duty of taking notes for all of you. Jury instruction number 12. It is important that as jurors and officers of this court, you obey the following instructions at any time you leave the jury box, whether it be for recesses of the court during the day or when you leave the courtroom to go home at night. First, do not talk about the case among yourselves or with anyone else during the course of the trial. You should keep an open mind throughout the trial and not form or express an opinion about the case. You should only reach your decision after you have heard all the evidence after you've heard my final instructions and after the final arguments. You may discuss this case with the other members of the jury only after it is submitted to you for your decision. All such discussions should take place in the jury room. Second, do not let any person talk about the case in your presence. If anyone does talk about it to you, tell them you're a juror of the case. 
If they won't stop talking, then report that to the bailiff or courtroom staff here as soon as you're able to do that. You should not tell your fellow jurors about what has happened. Third, during this trial, do not talk with any of the parties, their lawyers, or any witnesses. By this, I mean not only do not talk about the case, but do not talk at all, even if to pass the time of day. In no other way can all parties be assured of the fairness they are entitled to expect from those jurors. Fourth, during this trial, do not make any investigation of this case or inquiry outside of the courtroom on your own. Do not go to any place mentioned in the testimony without an order of the court to do so. You must not consult any books, records, internet, or any other source of information unless I specifically authorize you to do so. Fifth, do not read about the case in the newspapers. Do not listen to radio or television broadcasts about the trial. You must base your verdict solely on what is presented in court and not upon any newspaper, radio, television, or other media account of what may have happened. Each day, you will be required, as I mentioned, to sign an affirmation that you will follow this admonition of the court. That concludes the court's first instructions then, and as I mentioned, you will be provided copies of those when we deliberate. For further reference, next at this time, then I am going to have the clerk read the amended and redacted indictment to you. The defendants, Chad Guy Davo and or Lori Noreen Ballow and or Alex Cox, deceased, and or other co-conspirators, both known and unknown, on or between the dates of October 26, 2018 and continuing until January 15, 2020, <clears throat> in the County of Madison, State of Idaho. Willfully and knowingly combined, conspired in the first degree, in the first degree of Joshua Jackson Ballow, here and after J.J. Ballow, and to commit grand theft deception. 
Count four, first degree murder. The defendant, Chad Guy Davo, on or between the 8th and 9th day of September 2018, in the county of Madison, state of Idaho, and as part of a common scheme or plan for continuing criminal transactions between Madison and Fremont counties in Idaho, were concerned in the commission of a first degree murder and did aid and abet in its commission, were not being present, advised, and encouraged its commission or by command compelled another to commit the crime, and did so with malice of forethought, and did so willfully, deliberately, and with premeditation, which resulted in the death of a human being. To it, did either kill J.J. Ballow, and or assist in the killing of J.J. Ballow, and or did encourage the killing of J.J. Ballow, and or did command another to kill J.J. Ballow in violation of I Code. Count five, conspiracy to commit first degree murder. The defendants, Chad Guy Daybell, and or Lori Noreen Ballow, and or Alex Cox, deceased, and or other co-conspirators, both known and unknown, on or between the dates of October 26, 2018, and continuing until January 15, 2020, in the county of Fremont, state of Idaho, and elsewhere, including Madison County, Idaho, and as part of a continuing criminal transaction, in common scheme or plan in Fremont and Madison counties, Idaho, did willfully and knowingly combine, conspire, confederate, and agree to commit murder in the first degree of Tamara Tammy Daybell, and did combine, excuse me, and did combine or conspire to commit murder, and one or more of such persons did an act to affect the object, combination, or conspiracy. Count six, first degree murder. The defendant, Chad Guy Daybell, on October 18 to 19, 2019, in the county of Fremont, state of Idaho, was concerned in the commission of the first degree murder and did aid and abet in its commission, or not being present, advised and encouraged its commission, or by command, compelled another to commit the crime, and did so with malice of forethought, and did so willfully deliberately and with premeditation, which resulted in the death of a human being, to wit, did either kill Tamara Tammy Daybell and or assist in the killing of Tamara Tammy Daybell and or did encourage the killing of Tamara Tammy Daybell and or did command another to kill Tamara Tammy Daybell in violation of Idaho Code. Count seven, insurance fraud. The defendant, Chad Guy Daybell, on or about October 19, 2019, through October 30, 2019, in the county of Madison, state of Idaho, did with the intent to defraud or deceive an insurer the purpose of obtaining any money or benefit, insurer or other person, a statement as part of or in support of a claim for payment or benefit, knowing that such statement contained false, incomplete, or misleading information concerning any fact or thing material to such claim, to wit, did present and or cause to be presented an insurance beneficiary form to LifeMap Assurance Company in violation of Idaho Code. Count nine, insurance fraud. That the defendant, Chad Guy Daybell, on or about October 19, 2019, through October 31, 2019, in the county of Madison, state of Idaho, did with the intent to defraud or deceive an insurer for the purpose of obtaining any money or benefit, insurer or other person, a statement as part of or in support of a claim for payment or benefit, knowing that such statement contained false, incomplete, or misleading information concerning any fact or material thing to such claim, to wit, did present and or cause to be presented an insurance beneficiary form to Primerica Life Insurance Company in violation of Idaho Code. Signed as a true bill on the 24th day of May, 2021, signed by the deputy presiding grand juror, acting as presiding grand juror in Fremont County, state of Idaho. And to these charges, the defendant is under the plea of not guilty. All right, thank you very much, Madam Clerk, for reading the redacted amended indictment. In this case, again, I will advise the jurors, remember the indictment is a description of charges, it is not evidence. That concludes the court's opening instructions and reading of the indictment.
trees in this one as well. Uh, the next matter we would take up then our opening statements and inquire of the state. Is the state ready to proceed with openings? Yes, Your Honor. Uh, who will be giving the opening statement? I will remember. Very well. Mr. Williams, you may present your opening. Your Honor, may I inquire? Is there a hand mic so that I may address the jury? I think we do have one. Might take us a moment to get it. Double G. And then I do have a PowerPoint attached. All right. May I proceed your phone? Yes, it's for that, which you and I. May I proceed your Yes, sir. Sure. Two dead children buried in the defendant Chad Daybell's backyard in September of 2019. The next month, his wife is found dead in their marital bed. 17 days after the death of his wife, Tammy Dago, this defendant is photographed laughing and dancing on a beach in Hawaii at his wedding to Lori Vallow, a woman who was his mistress and the mother of the children buried in the graves on his property. Three dead bodies. This defendant believed he had a right beyond the ordinary. When he had a chance at what he considered his rightful destiny, he made sure that no person and no law would stand in his way. His desire for sex, money, and power led him to pursue those ambitions. And this pursuit led to the deaths of his wife and Lori's two innocent children. Chad Daybell is an author who wrote, tell, who wrote books about the apocalypse. During this trial, you will hear a story more troubling. And the story is real. Chapter one. The defendant was a seemingly ordinary man. You'll see that he craved significance. He worked in journalism and he worked as a sexton in a graveyard. He married his wife, Tammy, in 1990 after meeting at Brigham Young University, and they settled in Utah. As a full-time homemaker and mother, Tammy's love for her family was boundless. Together, Tammy and the defendant started a small publishing company, which Tammy supported in many ways. They had five children together. They moved to Idaho, where Tammy became a beloved school librarian she was devoted to service, her community, and her faith. But for this defendant, that ordinary existence was not enough. Chapter 2. Lori Vallow was a homemaker from Arizona. Your Honor, this mic just... Sorry, Mr. Lee. Let's see if we get a replacement mic. I think it's... I got to work it out. Okay. I've noticed that the PowerPoint is not up. Yeah, I think your mic's off again. Okay, I didn't turn it off this time. So I didn't my power. You want us to plug in the screen as well? Your Honor, it's up on the screen, and I can it's plug in the HDMI. I'm not sure why it's not. Transfer. Okay. 
know if there's any more personality with that. Let's see if we can get some help to maybe see if we can get the signal to work on that. Sorry. Can I proceed? Yeah, but I'm still not sure how much is that not working. Check. Okay. That's apologies for the interruption. I can down. Chapter two. Lori Vallow was a homemaker from Arizona. She was married to her fourth husband, Charles Vallow, and she was the mother to Tylee Ryan and JJ Vallow. Tylee was a normal, vibrant teenage girl. She loved her friends. You'll hear that she loved her Jeep. She loved Chipotle. She loved her little brother, JJ. JJ was a seven-year-old boy on the autism spectrum. He required extensive special care needs. He loved his sister. You'll hear about a pivotal date that set in motion the deaths of Tammy, Tylee, and JJ. October 26, 2018. That was the day when Chad Daniel and Lori Bala met at a religious conference in St. George, Utah, where they were introduced by a mutual acquaintance. At this time, both still married to other spouses. That introduction set in motion the reality you're going to hear about. We know what happened next to the defendant's own words. You'll hear. Though both married, Chad and Lori began to have an affair. You will hear excerpts from the defendant's extended text messages to Lori that reveal his mindset and his motivations. In his thirst for sex, power, and money, Chad created an alternate reality where they called themselves James and Elena. Names that Chad claimed were from past lives they had put together. The defendant's text messages reveal their story of lust and their plan for a future together. Chad Davo wrote that upon meeting Lori Vallow, he experienced a happiness unmatched by anything else in his 50 years. He was captivated by her appearance, so much so he said she was out of his feet. You will hear evidence in his own words how he was taken by her beauty and spoke about their sexual encounters on many occasions. More than anything else, Chad's obsession with Lori was rooted in her adoration for him. She was the mirror reflecting the grandeur he saw in himself. He called her an exalted goddess. He told her in writing that she had returned to Earth to form a special mission. Part of that mission included being with him. They soon came together and turned their dreams into a plan for the future. One free from what they called obstacles, and those obstacles were Tylee, JJ, and Kim. Chapter 3. You'll hear that in the world that Chad and Lori planned for themselves, they identified those who stood in their, the way of their dream as dark. Their spouses, Lori's own children, and any who oppose them were labeled sometimes as dark spirits or even zombies. This was more than an alleged belief of frightening labor. The evidence will show that it was a convenient narrative that dehumanized people who stood in their way and were labeled as obstacles. This narrative gave them the pretext to remove people from this world for their own good. Chad and Lori preached that only through spiritual intervention, what they sometimes call casting, sometimes through burning, or even through death, that these dark spirits be cleansed. Enter Alex Cox, Lori's devoted brother. Chad and Lori manipulated Alex with promises of spiritual rewards. They wielded their influence over Alex, drawing him into their plotting and planning of their own future. After the deaths of Tylee, JJ, and Tammy, Chad Dano gave Alex a blessing. It was This blessing was reported by Lori, who was present. And in that blessing, he said to Alex, you have earned the privilege to be a member of their exclusive religious group. And he also said to him, 
you have already assisted us in ways that can never be repaid. But you will also see other text messages. Chad and Lori discussed more earthly concerns, that Alex could be the one to implicate them. Alex knew this as well. Shortly before he died, on December 12, 2019, he told his wife, Zulana Pastens, who you will hear from, he was afraid he was going to be Chad and Lori's small guy. Chapter 4. Once their calculated plan was devised, it only took months to execute and remove perceived obstacles in Chad Daybell's path to a new life. Charles Vallow, Lori's husband, who was labeled as dark by the defendant, was shot and killed by Alex Cox in Arizona. Lori stood to gain $1 million, money that could fund Chad and Lori's future. Yet following Charles's death, Lori Vallow awaited a $1 million life insurance payout that never came, only to learn that the beneficiary was no longer her. Upon learning she would not receive that insurance money, Lori would text Chad, I'll still get the $4,000 a month from SS, meaning Social Security. Chad replied to her in a text that read, It will be interesting to see if it got changed after he had two bullets in his chest. Kylie Ryan, also branded dark and a zombie, was last seen on September 8, 2019. Subsequent investigations revealed the horrifying truth. Her remains, charred and dismembered, were found in a grave on Chad Abel's property. Without Charles' $1 million in insurance money to support them, Lori Vallow continued to illegally receive Tylee's Social Security benefits, provided after the death of Tylee's biological father, who had been Lori's third husband. According to this defendant, J.J. Vallow, Lori's son, was also possessed. After he was labeled as a dark entity, his fate was no less tragic than his sister's. His young life was also pointed. Later, his bound body was discovered buried in Chad's backyard, his death by suffocation. Yet while JJ was missing, Lori continued to illegally receive JJ's Social Security benefits, money provided by Charles Fallow's dad. Tammy Daybell, a vivacious, healthy mother, was another individual labeled as a dark spirit be removed. On October 9th of 2019, she reported being shot at at night near her home by a man covered in black. She thought it was a paintball gun. On October 19th, 10 days later, she died in her own home with her husband present. This was soon after an increase in the value of her life insurance to more than $400,000. This defendant rapidly cashed in that life insurance and began looking for condos in Hawaii with Lori. You'll see the rental application he submitted for a couple with no kids. Medical, examiner, medical examiners would later determine that the only reasonable explanation for Tammy's death was not of natural causes, but rather a homicide. In fact, you will hear from multiple witnesses that Chad predicted multiple times that Tammy would die of a broken back. Chapter 5. 17 days after his wife's death, Chad Daybell and Lori Vallow got married and celebrated on a beach in Kauai, Hawaii, symbolizing what he called their eternal meaning. Chad and Lori were preparing their wedding well before Tammy's death. Lori was shopping for wedding rings while Tammy was still alive. Now, without the earthly obstacles of spouses and young children, and with Tammy's insurance policy and the children's social security funds, they could live the life that Chad and Lori wanted. Nothing was going to stand in their way. Chapter 6. Unfortunately for this defendant, reality soon shattered their bliss. Two things led law enforcement to his and Lori's door. On October 2nd, 2019, 
Lori Vallow's nephew-in-law, a man named Brandon Boudreaux, was shot at in Arizona by someone from what he believed was Tyler's Jeep. Law enforcement in Arizona investigating Brandon's shooting contacted law enforcement in Fremont County, Idaho to look for Alex Cox and for Tyler's Jeep. And you'll hear that that Jeep was later found in Rexford, Idaho, in Madison County. Meanwhile, J.J. Vallow's grandmother, concerned that she hadn't seen or heard from him in months, asked police for help. They, the police followed up and located Lori in Rexburg, Idaho, where the police did a welfare check at Lori's apartment. Law enforcement arrived at Lori's door on November 26, 2019. When asked about Lori, Chad first told law enforcement he didn't know her very well, despite the fact that they were married and had been in a relationship for over a year. Lies by Lori to police about JJ and Tyler's whereabouts, and then a move to Hawaii, and Lori's unwillingness to present her children to law enforcement to prove their well being led to her arrest and extradition. As Lori refused to produce her children, law enforcement continued their search for Tyler and JJ. During that search, they located a unique text message that this defendant, Chad Daybell, had sent to his wife, Tammy, on September 9, 2019, which was when the day after Tyler Bryant's last known appearance. You'll hear from the FBI agent who found that message, but this message seemed longer than his usual text to Tammy, and it had a more conversational tone. In that text, Chad claimed he had an interesting warning that he shot a raccoon, that he buried it in what they called the pet cemetery, and that he'd had a fire on the property where he burned some wood debris. When law enforcement finally went to the defendant's property the following June, they didn't find a raccoon. They found Tylee's burnt remains that were buried in the pet cemetery. And they found JJ nearby buried under a tree near a pond. Ladies and gentlemen, you've been told this will be a lengthy trial. You will hear from many witnesses. You will hear a lot of evidence. You're going to hear a lot of dates. The following is just a timeline of major events to help understand when these things took place. October 26, 2018, Chad and Lori meet in St. George, Utah. July 11, 2019, Charles Vallow, Lori's husband, was shot and killed by Alex Cox. Between August 31st and September 1st, Lori, Alex Cox, and Tyler and JJ moved to Rexburg, Idaho, just a few miles south of the defendant's home. Tylee's last known sighting was September 8, 2019. The text I just spoke of about the raccoon was sent by the defendant to his wife September 9, 2019. JJ's last known sighting, you'll hear about, September 22nd. The attempted homicide of Brandon Boudreaux in Arizona was October 2nd. The shooting I mentioned of Tan, the shooting, shooting at her, the unsuccessful shooting, October 9th, 2019. Tammy's death, October 19th, 2019. 17 days later, Chad and Lori marry in Hawaii. Law enforcement did a welfare check looking for JJ November 26, 2019, in Rexburg, Idaho. November 26th and 27th, Chad and Lori leave town. June 9th, 2020, Tylee and JJ's remains are found on Chad's property. As I said, you're going to hear a lot of evidence from a lot of witnesses. And there's going to be kind of different groups of evidence you're going to hear from. You'll hear from law enforcement who will some of whom will give you a broad overview of the investigation and what they did. 
how to search from Tylee and JJ to, to a case of murder. You'll hear how it began by people who knew Lori and Chad, the James and Elena. You'll hear about the James and Elena story and about their relationship with each other and how they pursued their dream, their plan for a life together. You'll hear in the defendant's own words, people refer to as obstacles, how they need to be gotten rid of. You're going to hear financial evidence. You'll hear from an FBI forensic accountant and a detective, a social security administrator, investigator, who will talk about the finances involved in this case. You'll hear more from law enforcement, from multiple law enforcement agencies, the Rexford Police, the Fremont County Sheriff's Department, the FBI, Social Security Administration, about the investigation into these crimes. You will see forensic evidence. There, you'll see DNA testing to identify the body of Tylee. You'll see DNA testing that showed that DNA from Tylee was found on at least two tools in the defendant's shed. You'll hear digital evidence dealing with geolocation data tied to certain phones that were used in this case. You'll hear from Hawaii law enforcement about searches they performed in Hawaii on the defendant and his wife. And finally, you will hear many of this defendant's own words. You will hear voice recordings of this defendant. You'll hear, you'll hear excuse me, recorded phone calls between him and his wife, Lori Daybell. You'll read multiple texts that he and Lori sent back and other texts he sent to you. Chapter 9, What's Unwritten. The defendant stands before you today charged with multiple crimes. First degree murder for the death of Terry Daybell. First degree murder for the death of Tyler Ryan. First degree murder for the death of J.J. Ballard. Conspiracy to commit murder of Tammy Dado. Conspiracy to commit murder and grant that by the such the death of Tyler Ryan. Conspiracy to commit murder and grand theft by deception to the death of J.J. Ballard and insurance fraud. Two dead children buried in this defendant's backyard. The next month, his wife dead in their bed. 17 days later, this defendant marries Lori Ballard. Members of the jury, days or probably weeks from now, when the evidence in this trial is fully unfolded, we will have the opportunity to speak with you again. And at that time, we will ask you to end this horrible narrative. Your verdict will be the link that writes the final chapter of this tragic saga, a chapter that delivers justice for Tammy, justice for JJ, and justice for Tyler. Thank you. All right, thank you, Mr. Wood. That will conclude the opening statement of the state. Uh, Mr. Pryor, a couple of questions. First, uh, is the defense going to give an opening statement now or defer until later? And second, if you are going to give an opening statement, do you prefer we take a mid morning recess or go forward? Judge, could we take a short recess? And I have a Okay, I think this is a good time then for our mid morning break. We'll go ahead and take that now. And then once that's concluded, Mr. Pryor can give us a thanks statement to the events. All rise.
Thank you. Please be seated. Please have the chair. All rise. Very present and account for. All right. Thank you. Please be seated. <laughs> We've concluded our morning recess. We're back on the record on KCR 22, 21, 16, 23, State of Idaho versus Chad Padaba. This is the time we'll next have. Opening statements by the defense, Mr. Pryor, is the defense ready to proceed? Yes, Your Honor. May I have the proposed permission to enter the well? You may. Thank you. And maybe check that microphone to make sure it is working. Okay. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, as an introduction, I'm John Pryor. I'm the defense attorney for Mr. Daybell, and I'm from Meridian, Idaho. I'm an attorney from Meridian, Idaho over here on the west side of the state. Uh, I want to talk to you a little bit today. And um, at my age, video presentations are not something that would come easy to me. So I'm just going to talk to you a little bit about uh, uh, my view of the case and the facts and evidence. And what's important are facts and evidence. I think that when we went through the jury selection process, we talked about facts and we talked about evidence. And the judge gave you an instruction to talk to you a little bit about uh, you take into consideration the facts of this case and not be distracted by other things. Don't be distracted by speculation. Don't be distracted by guesses or assumptions or hunches. It all comes down to facts and evidence. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the facts and evidence of this case. Chad Daybell, uh, uh, and I'm learning this, and I've had some time to learn about this because it didn't come natural to me. But Chad Daigle went on what's called a mission early on in his life. And I guess what a mission is, and I'm not familiar with that, but I guess what a mission is, is they go away to a location and they talk to people about their religious beliefs. And Chad's faith, that was important as part of his faith. And when they returned from these missions, uh, they start the process of moving on with their lives. And when Chad got back from doing his mission in New Jersey, he met Tammy Daybell. Uh, another fact that I discovered, and you'll hear a little bit about, is that Chad had an extended um, uh, engagement, had an extended, by his faith standards, uh, 
uh, romance before they got married. Uh, Chad and Tammy dated for approximately six months. And what I understand is by their nature, six months is an extended uh, dating process uh, before you end up getting married. Uh, so after six months, they got married. They were married in Utah and uh, pr proceeded then to have uh, children. They have five children, now all five adult children. At some point, they moved back here to Idaho or moved to Idaho, and uh, they started a small publishing company. And you'll hear testimony that the publishing company was predominantly run by Tammy. Tammy managed it. Tammy was the brains behind the, uh, the company. And uh, Tammy basically took the reins and did everything that was necessary to move this publishing company. It was a small publishing company, a very small publishing company. And what they did is basically publish books. Chad would write these books. And he would write these books about his religious experiences. In his faith, he had certain beliefs, faith that he practiced, you know, when he went on his mission, when he, uh, uh, you know, read his interpretation of uh, the books that he used for his faith, he uh, started writing books about things that were consistent with his faith. Things like premonitions. We've all heard of premonitions, about being able to predict things, about being able to see maybe when things happen and, and some people believe in that some people don't some people have personally experienced that or i've been here before but he writes about his premonitions he writes about um good and evil and what it means to be good and what it means to be evil he writes about dark and light he writes about um, subjects that are a little darker like death and maybe the coming of uh, the end of, of things and, and when his savior in his mind is going to come back and and maybe there'll be some kind of a redemption of some sort but his books covered a lot of subjects like that and they were all based on fiction in other words he was writing these books about theories and things that came into his head and he would, he would write these uh, these stories but he also wrote children's books and he wrote books for teenagers and he wrote these books about adventures and and then the uh, you know, some crazy ideas about things that kids and teenagers get involved in. In about October of 2018, Chad was going out and he was invited by one of the uh, witnesses that you hear in this case to, to speak about his books. And this was not uncommon. He would travel and he would be asked to say, well, come and talk about some of the things that you, uh, you believe in. You, you, you talked about these premonitions, it's life experiences. You're going to hear testimony about that. And he was invited on one particular occasion in late October. And he attended this. And while he was there trying to sell his books, and like most of us who are business people, um, the focus of these meetings really was for Chad to try to get his books published because that's how he made a living. And he was there in one of his booths trying to promote his books and he laid them out there. And this beautifully stunning woman named Lori Vallow comes up and she starts giving him a lot of attention and she pursued him and she encouraged him. And you'll hear testimony that she went so far as to grab behind the booth and um, sort of help him in trying to sell some of his books. She obviously had an interest and maybe she felt that he was this, this publisher or maybe she had an opinion. You'll hear testimony about that. And then after the seminar, there was a length of time where there was no contact between the two of them, a month, month and a half, two months. Um, and during that time, Chad Dable went on his day-to-day -day life. He'd been married to for Tammy for some 29 years, uh, has no remarkable background of any kind. I think he, the testimony we offer will show you, had a, I think he had a speeding ticket in 2008. But Lori Vallow was a different story. Lori Vallow was someone who, right out of high school, married her first husband. You hear testimony about this. That marriage was very short lived, very short lived. She then married husband number two a few years later. And again, very short lived marriage. And there's some testimony indication that there was some problems with the marriage that uh, 
cause the breakup. But the concern seems to be, the theme seems to be that uh, Lori's brother, Alex, and you're going to hear about Alex Cox. Alex Cox was Lori's protector. Alex Cox would do anything and everything to protect, aid, and assist Lori Vallon in whatever her endeavors. Without unbridled question, anything. <laughs> and if Alex Cox even perceived that there was a problem, Alex Cox reacted. You're going to hear testimony that in 2007, I believe it was in August of 2007, Lori Vallow had finished up going through her third marriage with Joseph Wright. It was a tumultuous, you know, her testimony that it was a tumultuous marriage, a terrible marriage. And Lori Vallow made accusations against Joseph Ryan of abusing their child, Tylee. Yes, the same time. And during one of the visits of 2007, folks, and I, I want to tell you, you're going to hear testimony that in 2007, Chad Daybell didn't even know Lori Vallow existed. But Alex Cox, after one of the exchanges and the visitations with Tylee, Alex Cox approached Joseph Ryan and shot him with a taser and assaulted him. Was eventually charged with aggravated assault, was eventually put in jail, and had this on his record. And there was representation, the facts would suggest that at the time Joseph Ryan feared for his life. This was a serious situation. But it set the pattern for what we're dealing with with Alex Cox. Whenever there was a problem or a threat to Lori Vallow, you'll we'll hear testimony that Alex Cox came to the rescue. But Alex Cox would run without even question and do whatever was necessary to solve Lori Vallow's problems. We're going to fast forward then to 2019. Lori Vallow is still married to Charles Vallow. And the prosecuting attorney mentioned this. Yes, Chad Daigle at that point, coming in January and February, started to have communications with Lori Vallow. And yes, folks, it turned into an inappropriate relationship. 2019 forward. And yes, he was engaging in discussions. He was engaging in contact with her. All of the things that uh, the prosecutor talked about in terms of a, a relationship. But subsequent to the seriousness of this relationship getting rolling, Alex Cox was at a visitation in 2019 with Charles Vallow. And Lori Vallow was there. Tyree Ryan was there. JJ was there. They were all present. And during that altercation and that supposed visit, much like with Joseph Ryan, Alex Cox took out a gun and shot Charles Vallow. And then after calling 911, he then finished the job and walked up to him close range, finished him off. Now, you're going to hear testimony that in some way, Chad Daybell was implicated in that. And, and you're going to hear further testimony that he was not. You're going to hear testimony and see documentation that suggests that the prosecuting attorney on the review of this indicated that there is no likelihood of conviction of Chad Daybell. You'll hear testimony that Chad Daybell had nothing to do with the execution by Alex Cox Charles Vallow. And the same for Brandon Boudreau. You will hear that Chad Daybell is not being pursued for any involvement in the Brandon Boudreau attempted murder. Those occurred and those are separate, as well as the Charles Vallow. So what we have is we have a situation where someone who's 29 years old. Chad Daybell, 29 years of marriage with Tammy Daybell, no discernible issues in his life. And then Lori Vallow comes into the picture, Miss Texas. You'll hear testimony about this beautiful, vivacious woman, very sexual person, and very manipulative. And she knows how to get what she wants. And she drew, drew Chad Daybell into a relationship, and an unfortunate relationship, you know, that Chad fell and fell into. After that, things started rolling, and issues started happening, but eventually, yes, 
there was a murder and there was a burial. And you've heard discussion about the backyard of Chad Davon. Well, we have a four and a half acre farm in Fremont County, Idaho. And you'll hear testimony that the body of JJ Vallow was discovered behind an irrigation pond and a tree out in the pasture. So technically, yes, maybe the backyard, but more accurately described as the pasture hidden behind a tree. You're going to hear testimony that also in the middle of this pasture was a raspberry patch, former raspberry patch that was then turned into a, uh, a place for them to bury the cats, the dogs, and all of the animals on the farm. Okay. Again, out in the pasture of the field and not the backyard. You hear testimony about that. You're going to hear from four experts that I'm going to bring forward. And these four experts, the first one is going to be Dr. Greg Hampinkian. And Dr. Hampinkian is a, is a bit of a, a, a notable local from Boise State University. And Dr. Hampinkian is a DNA expert, considered one of the best DNA experts. He's been involved, has significant work that he's done on both the defense and for the prosecution. He was involved and led the team with Amanda Knox in Italy that got her exonerated because of the DNA evidence. He has substantial experience. And anybody or anyone who knows anything about DNA goes to Dr. Hampinkian first because he is the guy. And Dr. Hampinkian is going to talk a little bit about the DNA evidence that was found on the scene. Dr. Hampinkian is going to talk about the fingerprint on the plastic that J.J. Vallow was discovered in, it was that of Alex Cox. Dr. Hampinkian is going to talk about the hair sample that was found on the plastic of Alex Cox and that it was Lori Vallow. Dr. Hampinkian is going to talk about several, and I mean several other hairs that were found on the plastic of J.J. Vallow. But he's also going to say that there was no DNA evidence, no hair sample of Chad Daybell on Tylee Ryan or on J.J. Vallow. You're then going to hear from Dr. Raven. Dr. Raven is a forensic pathologist, and she's going to talk a little bit about the circumstances surrounding Tammy Daybell. And what Dr. Raven is going to say is that there's no indication that this is either a homicide or any other crime, and that the only conclusion she could come to is you can't determine what the cause of death was. There's no way to determine it. Tammy Daybell was buried. You'll hear testimony about that. And then a short time later, the police officers showed up and they dug her body up after she'd been buried, after she was laid to rest, and then continued after the body was pulled out of the ground and continued to examine it for whatever they were looking for. And what you're going to find is based on that, Dr. Raven's going to say you can't determine what the cause of death is. You're going to hear testimony from the Daybell children, from the children themselves, four of the five children, I think, three, three or four of the five children. Testimony. They're going to talk about their mother's health struggles. They're going to talk about their mother's use of various medicinal uh, treatments that she would use, oils that she would put on her leg, medicine and, and, and different herbs that she would take, and that her mother was suffering from, that their mother was suffering from a number of maladies, and that she would refuse to go see a doctor or get it treated. And Dr. Raven is going to enlighten you a little bit about some of the circumstances regarding Tammy Dabo. You're then going to hear from Patrick Eller. He's a, a uh, he's a forensic digital data examiner, and Patrick Eller is someone who has spent his life in the military working um, uh, for various agencies, and we'll talk a little bit about that within the government to do data retrieval and data research. And he's going to talk a little bit about the phone records that are involved in this case. He's going to specifically talk about the travels of Alex Cox. Because you are going to hear testimony that Alex Cox went to 
Chad Daigle's property on the 9th of September. You're going to hear that Alex Cox approached Chad Daigle's property a half a dozen other, five or six other times. You're going to hear testimony that Alex Cox was there on the 23rd. And you're going to hear where Alex Cox was in a number of other times and places in his whereabouts and his travels for about a two, two and a half month period. And Patrick is going to, you know, offer you some information and data to support all of that. And finally, you're going to hear from a forensic anthropologist, and his name is Eric Bartlink. And Mr. Bartlink is going to talk to you a little bit about uh, the nature and then the, uh, uh, the, the nature of how uh, the, the remains of Tylee were uh, burned. Eric Bartlink is going to talk to you a little bit about the lack of complete skeletal remains and why, when Tylee was dug down the ground, there were there was not a complete set of skeletal remains. In fact, there were a number of pieces of that that were missing. You're going to hear a lot of evidence, and the judge has talked to us a little bit about not making a decision until you hear all of the evidence. And there's a specific jury instruction that talks about it. The jury instruction is, you know, consider all the evidence. Listen to the instructions from the court on how you're to proceed. Listen to the arguments of the prosecuting attorney and the defense. And then and only then do you make your decision. And at the conclusion of all that evidence, and at the conclusion of the judge's instructions, the arguments of both of the defense attorneys, I'm going to ask you folks to return the verdict on guilty. Thank you, folks. Thank you for your time. Thank you. All right, that concludes the opening statement of the defense. Then this time we will commence with presenting evidence. Uh, I understand the state does have a first witness to call. Is the state ready to do that? <clears throat> You know, the state is prepared. We we had spoken with your clerk earlier. We thought we were going to have a brief sidebar. Oh, let's discuss our schedule and put that in sidebar.
Council, thanks for uh, discussing scheduling. Our intention here will be to start with the state's first witness that uh, apparently will take some time. So we will plan on taking a lunch hour also at uh, right around noon if possible. So, Mr. Wood, are you going to be calling the first witness? Yes, Your Honor, and the state will be calling right here to see you. All right, well, go ahead and call your witness. We'll have him come up and sworn. Before you speak, please. Madam Clerk, raise your right hand this morning. This on this letter or a third of the testimony you're about to give will be the truth that should be met with the truth. So, help that. All right. Officer, as you testify, just remember to make a audible response to anything that has been questioned uh, so that the record stays clear and try to avoid speaking on top of anyone questioning you. That in mind, then, Mr. Wood, if you'd like to inquire in name. Thank you, Your Honor. Officer, will you state your name and spell your last name for the record? Ray Hermosillo, H E R M O S I L L O. Is that on? Your Honor, is that microphone on? Yeah, I'm not sure. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, why don't you go ahead and start over and just talk right into the mic, please. Detective, will you state your name and spell your last name for the record? Ray Hermosillo, H E R M O S I L L O. Thank you. Detective Hermosillo, what is your occupation? I'm currently a lieutenant in the detective division for the Rexburg Police Department. How long have you been a detective? Five years. And how long were you involved in law enforcement before you became a detective? Before I was a detective, 18 years. Have you worked for any other law enforcement agency, agency other than the Vestment Police? No. And are you post certified? I am. Detective, are you, have you been involved in the case regarding Chad Daybell? Yes, I have. Do you know what Chad Daybell looks like? I do. Is he present in this courtroom? He is. He's of the defendant's table, for sure, in you know, low screen times. Thank you. So, let's talk about how did you initially become involved into the, in the investigation regarding Mr. Dago? On November 1st, 2019, I was contacted by Fremont County Sheriff's Office. I was told that there was possibly a Jeep uh, that was involved in an attempted homicide in our jurisdiction. So at that time, with that information, I contacted Gilbert Police and um, asked what they needed us to do to assist them. What did you do? Gilbert Police asked us to seize the Jeep if it was located. Um, they gave us the address of 565 Pioneer which is Rock Creek Townhomes. They asked, also asked us- I'm gonna stop real quick. Uh, where is that address located? What city? Rexburg. And what county is Rexburg in? Madison County. So once you received that address, what did you do? Gilbert asked us to seize the Jeep if we had located the Jeep. Um, they also asked us to perform intermittent surveillance. So at that time, that's exactly what we did. When you say intermittent surveillance, what, what did you do to perform that surveillance? When we were driving around, uh, when there was no other calls coming in, we were parking in front of the residence, behind the residence, take photographs of anybody leaving or coming in. Um, that's, that's basically what we did for the surveillance. And do you recall what date you did that surveillance? 
Uh, the dates were between November 1st and November 4th when I located the Jeep at 565 Pioneer. Did you ever uh, see the defendant at that address? I did. There were a few times during the intermittent surveillance that we had taken photographs of the defendant, Mr. Daybell, and Lori Vallow, um, either coming or going from the residence. And, and that was between the dates of November 1st and November 4th. Judge, could we have for the record how this officer established the I'm sorry, 2019. So, Right. And did you that uh, when you talked about seeing Mr. Daybell, was that between those dates of November 1st to November 4th, 2019? That's correct. And your primary job was to look for a Jeep. Is that accurate? Well, yes, that's correct. Your Honor, I'm going to ask that the witness be hand what's been marked, the state's exhibit 90. Where the court has a courtesy copy and counsel as well. Mr. Wood, to clear up, it sounded like you said 90. This is 9 I believe it's ready. Uh, so I can confirm my okay. You're correct, owner. 9H. Thank you. And that would be that it's 9A through 9D. Detective, do you recognize state's exhibits 9A through 9B? Yes, I do. What do they report to be? That is the Jeep that I had seized parked in the parking lot just outside of 565. Right. And was this, were these pictures taken at the location of 565 Pioneer? No, these photographs were taken uh, at our in-town lot at the police department. Right. Did you take these pictures? I did not. But do you recognize these images as true and accurate representations of the chief you seized from 565 Pioneer Drive? Yes. Your Honor, I'd ask the state's exhibits 9A through D be under the evidence. The objection from the defense. Judge, I'd like to move on here and make a correction and the foundation for the motion. All right. You can word our or ask foundational questions, Mr. Breyer. Officer Hermosino, you uh, thank you. You mentioned that you were doing surveillance on the Jeep. Is that correct? That's correct. Right. Uh, did you have an occasion to get close to the Jeep during that surveillance? We hadn't located the Jeep during that surveillance. I located the Jeep on November 4, 2019, and that's when I had it impounded. Okay. And at the time of being impounded, did you have the occasion to go through the Jeep and observe the Jeep energy? Or were you relying just on the photographs taken in the chain? Do you understand my question? No, sir. Can you repeat I'll it? Phrase that. Did you have a personal occasion to go through the inside of that Jeep and observe the contents within the Jeep? Your Honor, I think that that goes beyond the scope of this uh, specific exhibit. Uh, I guess the issue, Mr. Wood, is he indicated he did not take these photographs, and some of the exhibits also contain photographs of the interior of the Jeep. So proper uh more dire and of an objection thank you may i continue judge yes officer all i'm trying to establish is i don't want you to be able to testify that uh, the uh, you know someone else took the pictures and this is what they found uh, i want you to be able to you're authenticating and, and you're under oath to swear that these are accurate photos i'm trying to find out if that knowledge is based on your personal experience or is it simply based on the fact that you're relying on somebody else who told you this is what we found? So that's what I'd like you to clarify for me, if you would, sir. Sure. I impounded the Jeep. I was standing next to the officer taking the photographs. 
And I also went through the G personally. Okay, I would draw the objection. Thank you, Marcy. All right, the exhibits uh, 9A through D are admitted. Thank you, man. I'll to the jury. You, you may want to have a quick sidebar with counsel. Is it like a reporter? All right, Mr. Wood, if you'd like to proceed with publishing with the court's instructions there on the sidebar, then you may publish uh, any or all of your photos. Thank you, Your Honor. And if I could have access to the online. Is this, this is what you saw on state's exhibit A? Yes. Is this the Jeep that you had been assigned to do surveillance for? That's right. Did you, did you ever learn who this Jeep belonged to? I did. Who did it belong to? 
It was registered to Charles Mallow, but we later determined that Tylee Ryan drove that Jeep. The fact that this is states is that nine feet. Is this that same Jeep? Yes. That's all I'm going to publish now. All right, thank you. Detective, while you were doing uh, your surveillance, you testified that you had had occasion to see the defendant, Lori Mallow. Did you ever see children return? No, we didn't. Did you ever see anybody, anybody else with them? No. That's true. Were you at that time? Were you aware of who JJ Ballow was? No. Were you aware of who Tyree Ryan was? No. So when you spoke with, is it fair to say that when you were initially contacted by another law enforcement agency, they did not ask you to look for those children at that time? That's correct. Detective, did your role in this investigation change after that? Uh, it did. When did that happen? After I had seized the Jeep November 4th, 2019, I contacted Gilbert Police and let them know I had the Jeep. Um, Gilbert Police Department flew to Rexburg with a few of their detectives and a few of their crime analysts to go through the Jeep and serve a warrant on the Jeep. They were looking for the infotainment center, which is the middle of the Jeep console, it has the GPS locations, things of that nature, and they wanted the information extracted. So when they were up here on November 18th, 2019, um, they asked me and the other detectives if during our intermittent surveillance if we had seen any children and we told them we hadn't they stated that their that jj's grandmother judge i'm going to object to this point we're, we're, we're I'm trying to be somewhat uh, open-minded about foundation but i'm going to object i'll ask a question now. go ahead please. So you did have further contact with law enforcement from Arizona? Correct. And which law enforcement agency was that? Gilbert Police Department. And it was a Gilbert Police Department that was looking for that chief? Yes, it was. Okay. Uh, when, you, uh, when you followed up with them about the chief, did they give you any other information about their case? They did. Did any of that, in, that information regard children? Yes, it did. How? Oh, what were you? What were you told by Gilbert Police? Judge objection. Here, saying it's coming in for the effect on the listener, Your Honor. Yeah. Judge, can we approach? Uh, no. Give me a moment to make a ruling on that. Uh, I'll start. The witness can answer the question, but for only the purpose of effect on the listener, if you can clarify that with your witness, Mr. Wood, sure. and any objections overruled. Detective, based on your conversation with Gilbert Police, did you take any action regarding any children involved in this case? Yes, we did. And for the purpose of, of what you did, what, what information were you given that you needed to look up on? We were informed through their investigation that JJ's, JJ Ballow's grandmother was concerned for his safety. Judge, and again, I'm going to object at this point. We can renew my objection. That's going beyond. I'll yeah. also stand on as, as uh, bringing up their statements to work. Based on your conversation with Gilbert Police, what was the next step you took in your investigation? 
when we were requested to do a welfare check on JJ Bellow from the Gilbert Police Department. The detective, had you ever met JJ Bellow? No. I. Were you provided any identifying information as to his age or where he might be located? We were provided very little information, just a brief description of what he looked like, his age, um, and where he should be, which was 565. Sorry, 565 Pioneer Road, where he lived with his mother, Lori Bell. Your Honor, I'm going to ask that the witness be here in States of the one. Judge, I'm going to stipulate to the admission of states of the All right. Thanks for being offered, Mr. Wood. Yes, Your Honor. There are states of the limit one has been offered without objection. The court will admit states of the limit one. And, Your Honor, with that stipulation, I'd actually ask that uh, the witness be handed states exhibit two and states exhibit three as well. Further stipulate to states exhibit two, stipulate to states exhibit three. Very well. Uh, then, presuming you're being offered states exhibits two and three are, are also admitted. And Mr. Wood, if they're going to be published in the end, it should be discussed with court days. Yes, I'll be doing that. Thank you. Detective, can you look at states exhibit one? Okay. What is state's exhibit? That is a birth certificate out of the state of New Zealand. Your Honor, where this is admitted, may I publish? Yeah. Detective, can you identify who this is a birth certificate? The name on my birth certificate is Keenan Todd Trahan. What is the birth date? May 25th, 2012. And where is the place of birth? Lake Charles, Louisiana. Your Honor, if I may publish states in the video. Two. Yeah. Detective, I'm going to ask you to turn to the second page of State's Exhibit 2. Detective, what is State's Exhibit 2? It's a decree of adoption. And reading through that, do you are you aware of who that is? It could be an ad adoption for. Yes. Who is it for? Kenan Todd Trahan. And on the bottom of that, can you read the second to the bottom paragraph? That paragraph. The entire paragraph. Yes, please. It is further ordered that judged and decreed that the name of the child, Kanan Tawtrahan, be changed as follows Joshua Jackson Vallow and the Registrar of the Louisiana Department of Public Health and Statistics is hereby ordered to make the appropriate changes in his records. May I publish thanks for the three year old? Yes. Detective, what is states is three? 
That is also a birth certificate from the state of Louisiana. And who is the birth certificate for? Joshua Jackson Bell. Second, in the course of your investigation, in the course of your investigation, have you learned what Joshua Jackson or JJ Bell looks like? Yes. Have you seen pictures of him? Yes, I have. Uh, were you able to access pictures of him from uh, iCloud accounts associated with his mother? Yes. Your Honor asked that the witness be handed states exhibit four. All right, the witness is here in the state Detective, you testified that you never mm -hmm. met JJ Ballow, correct? Correct. Um, how did you come to know what he looked like? Through photographs you were given. Okay. Um, where did you get those photographs? We received a few from Gilbert Police. His grandmother, Kay Woodcock. I think that's that's all I can remember. And I spoke with you briefly before. Did you ever have occasion to review iCloud accounts belonging to uh, Lori Ballo? Yes, we did. And on those iCloud accounts, did you find other pictures of Joe, of JJ Ballo? Yes, we did. And did you find videos of JJ Ballo? Yes. Based on your investigation, what does Exhibit 4 purport to be? A photograph of JJ Bell. Hi. And you didn't take this picture, correct? Correct. But you recognize uh, that individual as Joshua J or JJ Bell? Yes. Your Honor, for demonstrative purposes, the state would uh, move to admit the state's Exhibit 4. Any objection? Judge, there's a little bit of foundation that I Iron. So, what, what's the source of that picture? Lori's iCloud, Lori for style, iCloud.com. Judge, can we approach just briefly on this issue? Based on a sidebar with counsel, I understand the defense does not have an objection at this point to exhibit four being admitted. Is that correct, Mr. Spire? Yes, Your Honor. All right, exhibit four then is admitted. Your Honor, may, may I publish to the jury? You know.
Like a who, who is that? That's JJ Bell. Detective, you were talking about receiving a request to do a welfare check, correct? That's correct. When did you receive that request? On November 25th, 2019, late evening hours, I received a call from Detective Pillar with the Gilbert Police Department, and he requested that the judge. I'm going to object to this. Her request is a hearsay. Uh, at this point, I don't hear an objection on the first say, so you can proceed. Go ahead and repeat the question, please. What did you do in response to that request? On November 25th, 2019, I received a call from Detective Miller, the Gilbert Police Department. He requested that I do a welfare check on JJ Bell the next morning. Because he wasn't able to get a hold of JJ or that was the same as you're saying. Did you do a welfare check for JJ Bella? We did. What date did you do that? November 26, 2019. How did you go about doing that? On that morning of November 26, 2019, myself and Detective Dave Holden went to Lori Bellows' residence, where we presumed JJ was at. Uh, she lived at 565 Pioneer, apartment 175. As we approached, expecting to speak with Lori, uh, we noticed the defendant, Chad Daybell, and Alex Cox unloading a pickup truck near the garage area. And at this point, were you aware of who Chad Dado was? Yes. How would you learn about him? Through our investigation with Gilbert and communicating with Gilbert Police Department. And so you recognized who he was? Correct. And at that time, were you aware of who Alex Cox was? Yes, we were. So after you saw them, what did you do next? I got out of my vehicle and made contact with Alex. Um, he was standing at the driver's side of his pickup truck, and the defendant, Dave Bell, was on the passenger side. I asked Alex if Lori Ballow was home, and he stated that she wasn't home. I asked Alex if JJ was home, that we were there to do a welfare check. And at that point, Alex got a surprised, frightened look on his face, looked over at, across the pickup, at the defendant, Dave Bell. Uh, the defendant, Dave Bell, then looked back at Alex. And initially, neither one of them answered my question. After they didn't answer your question, what did you do? I asked them again uh, if JJ was home, and Alex Cox finally answered and stated that JJ was with his grandmother in Louisiana. When you were given that information, did it cause you any concern? It did because I, I informed Alex that it was highly unlikely because his grandmother. Judge, I'm going to object at this point. We're going to be getting into this. Also, Your Honor, I think we the defendant's about to testify what he said to Alex Cox. Okay, that's not what I understood where it was going. You may ask the question, Mr. Wood. Second, what did you say to Alex Cox? I informed Alex that it was unlikely because Kay. Judge, I'm going to object. This is going to lead into hearsay. Your Honor, this is a statement by a declarant on the witness seat. It cannot be hearsay. Overruled, and it is uh, permissible. So, objection overruled. What did you say to Alex Cox? I informed Alex that it was unlikely that JJ was with his grandmother Kay because she was the one who called him the welfare check. And what was the response to that? 
there was no response initially. Uh, Alex again looked over at the defendant, Daybell, and they kind of both just looked at each other. Um, and at that point, I asked Alex where I could find Lori Bell. And did he give you a location to find her? He stated that she was in apartment 107, which is the same apartment complex, just a few apartments down. What did you do at that point? At that point, I asked Alex if there was a way I could contact Lori and asked Alex for her cell phone number. And Alex told me that he didn't have her cell phone number. So, were you aware at that point that Alex Cox and Lori Vallow were siblings? Yes, through our our investigation with Gilbert, we knew that Alex Cox and Lori Vallow were extremely close. So, when Alex told me he didn't have his sister's cell phone number, I assumed he was lying to me. What did you do once you received that information? Myself and Detective Hope left the defendant, Dave Allen Alex, at the pickup truck. We went over to apartment 107 and see if we can make contact with Lori. At that point, we were just trying to find JJ Vallo. And were you able to locate him at apartment 107? No, we knocked on apartment 107. There was no answer. So at that point, Detective Hope began knocking on neighbors' doors to see if we could get a hold of anybody who would know if they saw a little boy coming in and out of that apartment or who resided at that apartment. And while Detective Hope was doing that, I started walking back to my vehicle to call for more detectives to come over to our location. Why did you call for more detectives? Because of the deception from Alex, I wanted to figure out what exactly was going on. And we were going to start canvassing the area and knocking on doors. So, the more detectives we had on scene, the better it was for us. And detective, to clarify, when you first saw Alex and Chad Dayville, did you speak with Chad Dayville? No, I personally did not. So I believe you testified that you started walking back to the original Correct. Right. What happened then? As I was approaching my car that was parked in the alleyway, I noticed the defendant Daybell driving towards me in a black Chevy Equinox. It appeared he had just left apartment 175 and was headed towards me in the alleyway. So at that point, I stopped him to have a conversation. What did you ask him? I asked the defendant, Dave L., when's the last time you saw J.J. Vallo? And he stated it was in October in apartment 107 with Lori Bell. Did you ask him anything else? I did. I asked him how he knew Lori, and he stated he had only met her a couple of times um, and that he didn't know her very well. Did that response cause any concern for you? It did. Why? Through our investigation, prior to me making any contact with the defendant, Dave Bell, or Alex Cox, we knew that Alex, correction, Chad, and Lori had been married two weeks prior to my conversation with him in the alley. So, is it fair to say? You were troubled by his generation. What happened after that? I asked Mr. Daybell, excuse me, the defendant Daybell, if he had Lori Bellow's telephone number so I could get hold of her. Um, and he stated he didn't have her phone number. Did you have any further conversation? I did. When I was speaking with the defendant Daybell, Detective Hope saw me talking with him and started to walk back to my location. As he approached, I again 
asked the defendant Dave over the lawyer's number because I assumed he was lying to me based on what I knew. And at that time, he did give me Lori's phone number. Did he tell you why he didn't give it to you in the first place? He did. He stated that he felt I was accusing him of something. And had you accused him of anything? No, I simply asked him the whereabouts of JJ and asked him for his wife's telephone number. Detective, uh, during this interaction, were you wearing a bike here? No, I wasn't. Why not? In the detective division, most of our interviews are in a controlled environment. We call people in the police department. We have an interview, interview room set up with cameras. So most of the time, we're doing conducting our business and our interviews at the police department. It's very rare we're the first officers or detectives on scene. There is one body cam between seven detectives. <clears throat> Unlike patrol, where a patrolman is assigned a body cam, a detective is not assigned a body cam. What happened after you got that information from the defendant? I called my lieutenant at the time and told him what was going on. I felt that based on the deception and lies from the defendant, Dave L., who is JJ's stepfather, the lies and the deception from JJ's uncle, who is Alex Cox. I felt there was more going on with the whereabouts of JJ. And so at that time, I wanted to get everybody over there to see if we could figure out what was going on. So I asked my lieutenant to gather some detectives and respond to my work. And then what happened? A few minutes later, uh, my lieutenant arrived with Detective Dave Stubbs, who had a body cam at that point. Um, we began knocking on doors. We went back to 175, which was Lori Rowell's apartment, and started knocking on her door and didn't get any answer. And I apologize if I missed it. Who was your lieutenant? Ron Ball. All right, so after you weren't able to get any answers, what did you do next? Through our investigation, we learned that Lori Vallow's niece, Melanie Boudreaux, it was Melanie Klauski, no correction, Melanie Boudreaux at the time, it's now Melanie Klauski. She lived in apartment 174, which is right next door to Lori. So at that point, we knocked on her apartment as well to see if Lori or JJ was at that apartment. Did anybody answer? No, they didn't. What did you do next? I was instructed to go back to the police department, go to the prosecutor's office, to see if we can obtain a search warrant to search the residence for J.J. Vallow, while the other detectives stayed on scene and started knocking on doors in that complex. At that point, our only focus was to find JJ and to figure out what was going on. So we were going to exhaust every means that we could to see if we could do that. And that's why I went to the prosecutor's office to see if I could obtain a search warrant. Uh, and did you obtain a warrant that day? No. Why not? On the way to the prosecutor's office, Detective Hope, with the number that the defendant Dave L provided, called that number. There was no answer, but he left a message. Once we got to the prosecutor's office, Lori Vallow called back and she was instructed to open the door. There were detectives outside of her door that wanted to speak with her. And are you aware of any other if any detectives were able to make contact with her that day? Yes, they did. Do you know who that was? Detective Stubbs and Detective Ball. And you had mentioned earlier that Detective Stubbs had a body cam on, correct? Correct. And do you know if their interaction with Lori Vallow was recorded? Yes, it was. Have you watched that video? Yes, I have. Okay. 
At that point in your investigation, what did you do? After after Detective Ball, Detectives Ball and Stubbs had spoken with Lori Ballot, what did you do? What did you do next? We were informed that JJ was with a family friend. Judge, I'm going to object to this. Yeah. Uh, I'll sustain that. Detective, did you speak with Detectives Ball and Stubbs about their interaction with Lori that day? Yes. Did you speak with them that day? Yes. Did you watch the body cam of their interaction with Lori Ballard that day? Yes, I did. So you're aware of what she said to them? Correct. Based on what she said to them, what did you do next in your investigation? We attempted to locate the family friend to see if JJ was with her in Gilbert, Arizona. And who, do you know who that family friend was? Melanie Gibb. Were you able to contact her? Yeah. I was not. Did you have any interaction with Arizona Law Enforcement Bay about contacting Melanie Gibb? I did. It was starting to get into the later hours of that evening. So I contacted Detective Pillar with Gilbert Police Department. And I had him go to Melanie Gibbs residence to see if JJ was there. Ultimately, we learned he was not there. About what time did you learn that JJ was not with Melanie Gibbs? Roughly nine o'clock at night. And what did you do when you found out that he was not there? I contacted uh, Lieutenant Ball and let him know, um, and we agreed to meet at the prosecutor's office that next morning early to obtain search warrants for those apartments. Okay, and just for clarity of the record, which apartments are you talking about? Apartment 175, which belonged to Lori Vallow, 174, which belonged to Melanie Boudreau, and apartment 107, because that's the last time uh, JJ was seen based on the defendant Daybell's statements. Detective, were you able to obtain those warrants? Yes, we were. What did you do? Well, what day did you obtain those warrants? November 27th, 2019, in the early morning hours. And on that day, did you execute those warrants? We did. Let's talk about that. Uh, where did you search first? We searched apartment 175 first. Was there a reason you searched there first? That was his address that we were given from the Gilbert Police Department, and that's where his mother lived. Uh, what did you find in apartment 175? So initially, when we broke down the door, everything looked ordinary. There were couches, there were papers on the table, there was food in the refrigerator, food in the pantry. Um, we went upstairs, there were, there were beds, uh, pictures, everything seemed that, that people lived there. The thing that caught our attention was there were no clothes on the hanger in any of the closets. Zero clothes. Just a bunch of empty hangers hanging in there like some people. Took the clothes off and, and left. Did you locate JJ in that apartment? No. Did you see any evidence whatsoever uh, to suggest that he had been living there? Yes, we did. There were a couple things. We located a child's Star Wars suitcase underneath a little crawl space under the stairs. It was mixed in with some, what I can best describe as 72 hour kits. And the kits have like uh, flashlights, flares, water. The suitcase was mixed in with those. We also found an old prescription bottle prescribed to JJ of Respiradone. 
and then we're miscellaneous photographs of JJ and, and the residents. And did you see any other evidence of any minor changes? No. Correct. We did. When, when we first went inside, there were some scooters and a small child's, uh, look like a small child's bike right on the porch. Okay. Did you seize anything from the home that day? We did. Uh, I seized the respiratory and the suitcase. After you searched apartment 175, what did you do next? We searched 174, which was Melanie Goudreau's apartment. Everything appeared normal in there. There were no signs of JJ or anything that, that he was even there. But we also searched apartment 107, and that was completely vacant. There was there was nothing in apartment 107. Did you seize anything from apartments 174 or 107? We seized um, in the apartment 174, we see some cash, large amounts of cash that were found in the closet. And the only reason we, we seized those were for safekeeping because we had kicked the door in there as well and it wasn't able to lock. So we took that. Did you locate any weapons in any of those apartments? So in apartment 175, when we were searching the garage area, we located several different style weapons, handguns, rifles, uh, various calibers, army knives, uh, a lot of different weapons that were inside the garage. And, and why did you seize those? Again, for safekeeping, um, that apartment didn't lock. And so we took those, so it would be stolen. Did you find any evidence that JJ Vallow had been in his apartment 174? No. Did you find any evidence that JJ Vallow had been in apartment 107? No. Did you search any other building that day? We did. In apartment 175, we located a storage unit rental agreement contract. And on that storage unit contract was the name Lori Ryan. Uh, it had listed her as the tenant, and it listed the storage unit number as T52, and it gave an address of self-storage on Airport Road in Rexburg. So with that information, we were able to obtain a search warrant for that storage unit as well. And did you participate in the search of that storage unit? Yes, I did. Did you, what did you find there? There were a few bikes, children's bikes. There were boxes of winter clothing, some ice skates. Um, there wasn't a lot in the storage unit. There was a personalized uh, a family blanket, a big blanket with family photos that were kind of sewn onto the blanket. Those photos had JJ Vallow, Tylee Ryan, and their sibling, Colby Ryan. There were pictures of Lori Vallow. But other than that, there was there was nothing else really in the story. When you perform these searches, were you looking for Tidy and I? No. <clears throat> so to your knowledge, she hadn't been reported missing. That's correct. Your Honor, if I could have a brief step up. Yes.
Mr. Wood, I understand this would be a good breaking point in this testimony for the lunch hours. Yes, Your Honor. Okay, we're going to go ahead and take our lunch recess at this time. Uh, before we do that, again, I will just advise the jurors please don't discuss the case amongst yourselves or with anyone else over the break. In addition, for those in the courtroom, we will be closing the courtroom, I believe, during the lunch break. Uh, so, things you have in here will need to go with you. We'll reopen uh, upon the conclusion of the lunch break, and we'll still be under the courts. Governing order for court of conduct on the return. So, thank you for complying with that. I was that in mind. We'll be able to go on to the now. All rise.
Thank you. Please be seated. Mr. Wood, before we proceed, was the state going to be ready um, before the general direction? Is there anything to bring up? Uh, yes, sir. if you have a sidebar about the issue, the evidence issue is not ready. Okay. All right, we're on the record now. This is CR 2221-1623, State versus Chad Guy Devo. The jurors are not present at this time. Had a sidebar with counsel. Uh, previously, a few of the exhibits that were offered and admitted had some reference material on them, uh, base numbers, et cetera, from uh, the case that the court raised a concern, and I believe Mr. Wood, what you've done is figured out a way to remove those references from the exhibits. And the court would know those references were not published to the jurors, and they won't be. So the court will permit those references to be removed from the exhibits before they are published or provided to the jurors. Is that uh, how we're going to handle that, Mr. Wood? Yes, that's my understanding, Your Honor. All right. And this prior any objection from the defense to proceeding in that matter with those two exhibits? No objection. Okay, thank you. I'll make sure then that the original court exhibits to the jurors will have that information removed before the jurors are either published the information or receive copies of it. And with that, then I believe uh, there are no other issues to take up before the jurors are brought in. Is the defense ready to proceed as well, Mr. Pryor? Yes, Your Honor. All right, thank you. Then we'll continue with uh, testimony of this witness and Mr. Wood, if you're ready, we'll have the jurors brought in this time. Thank you.
All rise. Thank you. Please be seated. We concluded the lunch break at this time. We're continuing with uh, testimony of Detective Hermosillo and Mr. Wood. If you're ready, you can inquire now. I remind the witness you're still under oath for your testimony. Thank you, Your Honor. Detective, uh, before we broke, we were speaking about the search of a residence. Can you remind us what residence that was? Uh, I believe it was apartment 175. Um, and whose who's residence was that? Four dollars. Your Honor, the state would ask that the witness be handed the state's exhibit. States exhibit 7A through 7A. The witness is handed state's exhibits uh, seven A through K. They've been reviewed by defense. Mr. Woody, do you recognize state's exhibits seven A through K? Go ahead and take a minute to review them. Yes, sir. Uh, what do those exhibits look like to be? They are photographs that were taken on Lord Bell's residence in the morning of November 27th. And were you present? You justified or you were present at the search of that apartment on yes. that date, correct? That's right. Did you walk through every room in that apartment? Yes, I did. Uh, did you take these pictures? No, I did not. Do you recognize them as true and accurate representations of what you witnessed in that room that day? Yes, I did. I'm sorry, in that apartment that day. Yes, I did. Um, 
Your Honor, the state is moving for admission. State's exhibit 7A to the committee. The injection from the defense. What do you need an injection? Yes, and use your microphone, please, Mr. Clark. May I judge? Yes. Officer, what time were these pictures taken? I don't know the exact time, roughly between 10 and noon, I would guess. Are you guessing or do you know? I don't know exactly what time she Okay. Who took the pictures? I don't know who took the pictures. What day did they take the pictures? I believe I testified November 27th, 2019. Well, if you weren't there, how do you know if you don't know who took them or who? Yeah, should he just stay in the testimonies? No, I'll, I'll allow it. You can continue to go there. I never once said I wasn't there. I was there the entire time on this. No, but the question. The question was you weren't there when the pictures were taken, were you? I wasn't there when they were taken. No. You don't know the condition of the home when the pictures were taken. Is that correct? I was there when the pictures were taken, not standing next to the photographer. So you were there when the pictures were taken. That's correct. And, but yet you don't even know who the photographer was who took the pictures. Is that what you're telling me? That's correct. Is there a reason why you wouldn't know a photographer who's taking pictures for a police investigation that you're in charge of? I wasn't standing next to the photographer. I was inside the residence when the photos were being taken. At the same time they were being taken, I was standing next to them. Okay, but the question I asked is why is it that you don't know the name of the photographer when this scene was closed off for an investigation pursuant to a search warrant and you can't tell me who the name of the photographer was who took these pictures? There were a lot of people that were part of that search warrant. I can't tell you exactly who took the photographs. Well, that's what my concern is. Okay, so prior and we're getting speaking objections now. If there's a continuing objection, state the grounds. Okay. Well, there were a number of people that were in and out of that apartment. Is that right? In and out of that apartment? No, sir. In that apartment, yes. How many people were in the apartment at the same time? Roughly 10. And you would know all of the names of the people that were in the apartment, right? Correct. Yet you don't know the name of the photographer who took the pictures. Is that what you're telling me? Yes, that's what I'm telling you, yes, sir. Judge, I'm going to object. Your Honor, I'm going to lay some more foundation. All right, you can lay additional foundation. And I'll also know it is a group of photographs. So if you have to work through them individually, we will. I'll note just an objection on 7 8 and And this will you can uh, see the additional foundation you lay before I rule on the objection. Detective, you testified you were present that day. That's correct. Right. And you recognize these images as true and accurate representations of what you saw in that apartment. That's correct. And is it a true and accurate representation of the condition you, you found the apartment in? Yes, sir. And as you as you look through these pictures, is there any anything in there that is different than the way you found it? No. Your Honor, the state moves again for the admission. Objection again, Judge. There has to be a proper foundation. The officer can't even tell me who took the pictures. He doesn't know what time the pictures were taken. And the condition he's talking about is the condition that he saw, not necessarily when the pictures, in the condition when the pictures were taken. So there has to be a proper foundation here. All right. I've considered the objection. I'm going to overrule the objection as it relates to photographs when the officer has personal observation of the location. The one exception that I'll consider a standing objection on is on 7G, which is uh, different, I would say, than just showing the apartment. Not saying it's not admitted, but it's still under advisement and any additional objection or foundation. So photographs with the exception of 7G are Admitted and you can inquire further, Mr. Wolf. Thank you, Your Honor. If I could publish those to the jury. Yes.
Secretary, can you tell me what you observed in State's Exhibit 7A? That's the front door of apartment 175, front porch area. And is this the economic that you searched? Like you were the JJ? Yes. Detective, what did you observe in State's Exhibit 7B? So as you walk into the front room of the apartment, that's looking towards the dining kitchen room area. Uh, there's a child's car suitcase sitting there. Like I testified earlier, it, it looked like it was lived in. There's still cups, things on the counter, paper towels, everything you look in the you observe for states exhibit seven C. That's standing in the kitchen facing the doorway. So the opposite direction of the glass door down. You can see the stairwell going upstairs. There's still pictures on the wall, TV, thing, papers on the counter. Everything looking normal at that point zone. So when I testified about the crawl space under the stairs and the 72 hour kits, those are a few of the 72 hour kits along with the stove or suitcase that will get located. Would you, Your Honor, is the, the courthouse pointer? So, I don't know what stuff the bailiff from the Melbourne developed. So. Can you point to what you're referring to describe the 72 hour kit? So these black back black bags. Just a little bit. Yeah. Okay, go ahead. These black bags with the 72 hour kits, there's some underneath here that you can't see. There's some here, and then that's the Star Wars suitcase that I was referring to earlier. Okay. Detective, what did you observe in the state's exhibit at 7 p.m.? That's the top of the stairwell looking down towards the bottom of the stairwell. This, this part right here goes into the front room and then the front door is right here. What did you observe in Chase Exhibit 7 at? This is the master bedroom. So when you come up the stairwell immediately to your left is this entrance here. Um, like I testified, there was bedding, pillows, everything looked normal in the room at that point. This is uh, a bathroom as well. What did you observe in the state's exhibit 7H? 7H is what caused some red flags for us when we were searching the apartment. Why was that? Because of all these empty hangers. Uh, people go on trips. Judge, I'm going to object because I'm responsive. There isn't a question here. That's a narrative. It's the same. Detective, I asked you why the empty closet was concerning to you. Because when we made contact with Lori Rallo the day before, 
she had lived in the apartment. She was in the apartment living. The very next morning, we served a warrant. This is what we found in the hangers. And Detective, why would empty hangers be concerning to you? Because it appeared to us that she grabbed her clothes, left everything else, and took off. Did you observe the state's exhibit seven I? This was a bedroom. If you walk down the hall towards the west, this is the bedroom on the right hand side. Uh, this is the bedroom we found Alex Cox, some of Alex Cox belongings in. So this is the bedroom to the right. And what belongings of his did you find there? There was a uh, Plastic tub with some of his warnings and some hygiene things that had his name on it. Like that. Yeah, what did you observe in States Exhibit 7J? This is the same bedroom. Uh, there's there's the, one of the plastic tubs that had some belongings of Alex. There's some uh, prescription pills up here that had Alex's name on them. And then there were some white Tyvek suits that were in the closet there. Right what did you observe in states of the 7K? This is the room to the left. So the, the previous room was to the right. This is the room to the left. It had twin beds, bedding, everything worked on in that room as well. Your Honor, I'm going to ask that the witness be handed states exhibit 7G again for further foundation. Very well. Do you recognize states exhibit 7G? Yes, I do. What does it report to be? A rental agreement uh, with the tenant of Lori Ryan. And you testified earlier about finding the rental agreement, is that correct? That's correct. Is this the rental agreement that you were speaking about? Yes, it is. And where did where was that located in the residence? In the master bedroom on a desk. In the corner. And you saw it there? That's correct. And is that a true and accurate representation of the rental agreement you saw? Yes, it is. Your Honor, I move for admission of States Exhibit G, 7G. Any objection? No objection. Uh, exhibit 7G is admitted as well. May I publish? Yes. Is this the rental agreement we were just speaking of? Yes, it is. And you testified earlier about searching the storage unit, correct? Correct. Is was this the rental agreement that led you to that storage unit? Yes. Thank you. Your Honor, I'd ask that the witness be handed what's been marked as State's Exhibit 8A through 8Q.
Second, I'm going to ask you to take a moment and read these. So it's sort of 8A through 8M. Second, so what do you state in the 8A to 8M report to be? Photographs that we have taken in the 175 New York. Uh, and what day were these photographs taken? November 27th, 2018. And was this a, a part of the search that you testified to earlier? Yes. And you were present in the garage? That's correct. Right. Were these items laid out in this manner when you got to the garage? No. Were they taken out to be photographed? Yes. And did you observe that taking place? I did. Right. And other than moving those items to be photographed, are these uh, pictures? Are these items in the same condition that you observed on that day? Yes, in the same condition, like I testified to, we manipulated some of them so we get better photographs. And are they true and accurate representations of what you observed in the garage of that apartment that day? Yes. Your Honor, the state would move for admission of state's exhibit 8A to 8M. Large. I'm sorry. I should have said eight L. Any objection as it relates to eight A through L. Judge Watching any objections. Very well. Officer, as before, were you present when the pictures were taken? Yes. Who was the name of the person who took the pictures? Detective Dave Ho. Were you present at the exact time that the pictures were taken of all of these items? Yes, I was. Who else was present at the time that these pictures were taken? I, I couldn't tell you who else was in the room. Well, we were in a garage, weren't we? Couldn't tell you who else was in the garage. Are there so many people there that you don't know? No, I don't. This doesn't go to the foundation. Uh, I'll allow a more for the regulations prior to the moment. So many people in the garage, you didn't know who was there. No, I just can't recall their names at this time. They're not officers that work with you? They are. Okay. How big of a garage are we talking about? I get the out of that. Two car garage, one car garage. As far as intervening costs here, is this a foundation objection still? Judge, I'm trying to establish. Judge, I'll move on. Save it. All right. Uh, the court's considered foundation objection as it relates to exhibits A through L. All over the objection, and those may be admitted. Thank you, Matt. Publish. Yes.
protected. What did you observe in the state's eight So when I testified earlier about various uh, magazines, uh, weapons, there were knives. This is where we found those items. And and this, I want to stop real quick to clarify when you say magazines, what type of magazine are you referring to? Magazines of one rifles. And you testified that you were these items to take pictures of. Correct. And what, what did you observe in states of the AA? So here are some of the various magazines that we took out of some of the tubs. There's some ammunition. There's a, a few suppressors that screw on to the end of a gun to muffle the sound. Uh, there's a ghillie suit. Different different items in this photo. Different spots. Any other questions? Did you tell me what you observed in states of the AP? So these were items that were located in black plastic bags, which are right here that I'm pointing to. So we simply took those items out of these plastic bags and laid them out so we get photographs of them. What did you observe in states of the eight C? These are various caliber ammunition in plastic bags that were located in plastic bags in the garage. When you say ammunition, those are for bullets, correct? Correct. What did you observe in states of the A B? This was one of the rifles that we had located in the garage in apartment 175. It's got duct tape here. Uh, what you can't see up top. Judge, I'm responsive. Yes. I moved the picture so you can see the top. What did you observe on top of states of the 8D? Like I was testifying to at the top of this rifle, it's threaded for a suppressor to muffle the sound of a gunshot. What did you observe in states of the AP? This rifle here is the exact same rifle from the previous picture. Uh, there's also another rifle that was in the bag, and that's this one here. This photograph was taken at the police department once we got the items back. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? This is the rifle in the previous picture that was back here. It's just a close up of that rifle. What did you observe in the states of the AG? Those are what I call the suppressors from earlier that. It was a photograph of these two men on the garage floor. This is just a close up of both of those suppressors. What did you observe in states of the AH? These are knives that were found amongst the ammunition in the, the rifles and the tubs. You distract the jury what you observe in states exhibit eight, eight I. Here we go. 
This is just a hand and that it's also located where it's still in the case inside of your eye. Did you observe the station with an AJ? This is a Halloween mask, or what we think is a Halloween mask uh, that was located in a plastic bag in the garage, along with duct tape and rope. You described the picture what you observed in states of the 8K. Once we remove the Halloween mask, this is the duct tape and the rope I was referring to in a Walmart bag. Fine. What did you observe in states of the 8 l That is a passport that uh, looks located in belongings in that garage belonging to Alex Cox. And Your Honor, I'd ask the witness to hand at State's Exhibit 8M through 8Q. Briefly review states of the eight ten through eight two. Okay. Do you recognize those exhibits? Yes, I do. What do they purport to be? These are items also located in the garage of one seventy five. What we go through each. Not yet. Did you observe these items with your eyes? Yes, I did. And you saw these on November 27th during your search of apartment 175? Correct. I believe you testified they were also in the garage. That's correct. Are these true and accurate representations of what you observed that day? Yes. Your Honor, I move for the admission of States Exhibit 8M. Thank you. Any objection? Yes. One year and eight objection, Judge. Go ahead. Officer, you previously testified that you, I don't want to put words in your mouth, that you staged certain items. Is that a fair assessment? Correct. And some of the items that you staged, or that I mean, when I mean staged, you, you removed those from packages or boxes and you laid them out to take pictures. Is that correct? That's correct. Did you take pictures of all the items in the garage, or are these just selected pictures that you've decided to show today? We took photographs of the items in the garage. Anything that we thought was evidentiary value, we took photographs. Of. Okay, so the question is, in our excuse me, the answer is then that you did not take pictures of everything that was in the garage. Is that fair? No, Judge Your Honor, this is cross, not. Does it go to foundation of these items? I did you sustain that? We need to get on the narrow issue of foundation for admission or not, and then we need to be allowed to cross later, of course. Okay. Yeah, so, so the question is, is that 
And when I hear previously that you took items out of a package and then you took pictures of select items, did you take all of these items out of some sort of packaging and take select pictures of these as well? Yes, we took these out of tubs that were in the garage and took all of it. So when you were there and present going through the garage, and I don't, we don't know how big this garage is because you don't know. Um, you couldn't see these in plain sight when you went through them, correct? That's correct. So you don't know what was in the garage and what wasn't. These were staged by someone else who took the pictures of that, correct? We took these out of tubs and took photographs of them. Who took them out of the tubs? I couldn't tell you what officer took them out of the tubs. When did they take them out of the tubs? Are you asking for a time, sir? I'm asking for a time, yeah. Roughly ten to twelve, I would say. In the afternoon, in the morning, when when? Ten o'clock in the morning. Till okay. twelve noon. And you were present when they were taking these out of the tubs? That's correct. And who took these pictures off? You take the boat. Judge, I have nothing else. Thank you. All right, I'll rule an objection on foundation relating to exhibits 8 and 3 Q and those of the Thank you. Yeah. Detective, can you describe the jury what you observed in state's exhibit 8 M? <laughs> That is what appears to be an email printed item um, that was located in the garage of 175. There's some handwritten scribbles on it, some names, <laughs> numbers associated with those names. And at, at the time that you found those documents, did you understand what that meant? No. Were you able to determine, uh, you said it was an email, who the sender of the email was? Yes. Who was it? Chad Dado. Could you, were you able to determine who the recipient of the email was? Uh, I don't recall the recipient. Just you know, who sent it. Oh, I apologize, I didn't get that down. I just remember who sent the email. And do you, were you able to tell what date it was sent? I believe it was October of 2018. Is there a specific date? I would have to look at it a little closer. It says in the upper left hand corner. Second, I'm going to have to look at states. It's a bit faint and if you can describe what you observed there, that's really good. That's the same uh, photograph from the, from the last slide. And states exhibit eight O. Or is it O? Sorry. That's also more of the same uh, email papers from the last slide. And that could probably have states exhibit eight and back to Would you be able to tell the date? The emails. Yes. What is the date on that email? October thirtieth, twenty eighteen. And then, detective. What did you observe in states of the 8P? Those were also on the tab books written by Chad Dado. And then lastly, what did you observe in states of the 8Q? That was a cell phone that was also found in the tab in the garage. Were you able to look in? Get that cell phone at any time. 
Um, as far as forensic work, yeah. uh, I, I wouldn't be able to tell you unless I looked at the report. Like, but we've been talking about this search on November 27th, correct? Correct. And at any time that day, did you locate JJ JJ Dallas? No. What was the next step in your investigation to find JJ? Our next step was to talk to anybody that would take our phone calls. JJ was. Judge, I'm going to object. This is again becoming a narrative. Your Honor, he's still just answering the basic question. I'll do a loud objection. JJ was who we were looking for. And so we were exhausting every effort to find JJ. So we would call uh, his siblings, family members, any family friends, anybody that might know the whereabouts of JJ. So who were some of those? family members that you spoke with? We ended up speaking with uh, Brandon Boudreau, uh, Melanie Boudreau, um, JJ's brother, Colby Ryan, Gilbert Police ended up speaking with family members down there. That's who we spoke with. At any time during your investigation, did the scope of the search change into who you were looking for? It did. After Why we, was that? After we spoke with Colby Ryan, who was JJ's brother, he mentioned that he Judge, had, I'm going to object. This is your son. This is Heck of it, any time did the scope of your search change to include the search for Tidy Ryan? It did. And so let's go back to your search very briefly on November 27th. Did you see Tidy Ryan at that apartment at any time? No. And during your intermittent surveillance you talked about in early November, had you seen Tidy Ryan? No. Mm -hmm. Did you ever meet Tidy Ryan? No. Did you become familiar with uh, with who she was through your investigation? Yes, we did. How did you do that? After speaking with Colby, uh, our search encompassed JJ and Tyler. You know, I'm going to ask the witness we had in states is at five. Uh, I believe this comes in by stipulation. It does. Judge, we've stipulated the admission of this exhibit. The council would be so kind as to review the, the exhibit number for the piece. Five. Thank you. All right. Exhibit five has been offered and admitted. You can proceed, Mr. Wood. Thank you. Detective, do you recognize State's Exhibit five? Yes, I do. What is it? It's a birth certificate issues out of the state of Texas. You know, I, mean, I published that for the jury. No objection. Go ahead. Were you able to read that on the, the screen? Yes. If you could point out with the pointer the name of the individual for who that who that birth certificate applies. The name is Tylee Ashley. And what was the date of her birth? 
September 24, 2010. And where was she? Travis County, Texas. And just for purposes of the record, can you state who her father was? Joseph Anthony Ryan Jr. And who was her mother? Lori Noreen Cox. To your investigation, have you learned of Lori Vallow's maiden name? Yes. What other Cox? Okay. So, Detective, you, you testified that at this point you were approximately when did the scope of your search widen to include Patty Ryan? It was after we spoke with Colby uh, on December 11th, 2019. Uh, we entered JJ Vallow and Patty Ryan. Into what we call NICNIC, which is the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. So on December 11th, 2019, we entered both of those children as missing and endangered. How does NICNIC work? It's a center where. I'm going to inject this point on the foundation. Mr. Rose, if there's any additional foundation or anything that has been worked at this point. Can you? Restate again what the acronym NICNIC stands for. National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. And is that associated with the government entity? It is. Do you know what entity? Uh, I don't. Okay. Have you ever uh, used NICNIC before in your uh, job as a detective? Yes. Okay. How have you used it before? When we have missing children, we enter in. Called NICMIC, enter the information that goes into the database. Mr. Wood, for the record, could you indicate that address? Yes, Your Honor, it's N C M E C. Thank you. If you'd like the detective, can you just state what that stands for again? National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. Did you include any other law enforcement agencies in this search? We did. After November 27th, uh, we reached out for assistance from the FBI. Um, we reached out through Fremont County. Um, so we were, we were in contact with Gilbert Police, uh, Chandler Police. Anywhere down there where JJ or Tylee uh, lived or could possibly be at. And did you ever try to contact Lori Daybell in regards to the whereabouts of her children? Absolutely. How did you do that? We tried contacting Lori by her cell phone. We also attempted to contact. Well, let's talk about that real quick. Were you able to uh, talk to her? No, her cell phone was shut off. Did you ever attempt to contact Chad Daybell in regards to the location of the ship? Yes, we did. How did you do that? We attempted to contact him through his cell phone. And were you able to get in touch with him? No, it was also shut off. And at any time, did Lori Vallo ever call the rest of police? Report this in children. Judge objection. Foundation. Uh, response, Mr. Wood. Uh, Your Honor, it's just a basic question uh, that I think it's in line with the question we've been going to. I don't know what issue foundation. Our foundation is overruled. What is the answer? Did you ask that in Did Lori Vallow? Ever contact the Rexburg police, to your knowledge, regarding Miss Michelle? No, she didn't. Did Chad Daybell ever contact the Rexburg police regarding Miss Michelle? And I'll renew my objection, Judge. College foundation. It's overruled. No, he didn't. Detective, when you um, place the children in the uh, NICMIC, 
uh, database. You receive tips from that. Yes, we set up tip hotlines through NICMIC, also through the FBI and through the Rexburg Police Department. So uh, anybody with any information on those two missing children could call any one of those numbers and provide us with any information. And did you ever receive tips through NICMIC regarding JJ Vallow, Tyler Money? Yes, we did. What would you do when you receive those tips? When we would receive the tips, we would assign it a tip number. And those tips were followed up on by detectives or other officers. So as soon as those tips came in, they would be able to number and assigned to an officer or detective to follow up. And would would those tips, when they come in, do they have a phone number associated? A lot of times they did have a phone number. A lot of them were anonymous. They didn't want to get involved. Um, so some of them have phone numbers where we can follow up. Others didn't. And if someone submits an anonymous tip through Nickman, is there anything you can do to follow up on that? It depends on the information they gave us, um, but we would follow up with any information that they had put on the tip. And when and when a tip comes in with a phone number, would you call those individuals back? Yes. Did you ever alert the public that the children were missing? We did. We held a press conference on November 20th, 2019, and uh, alerted the public that we had two missing children in our area. And after that press release came out, did you receive tips after that? Yes, we did. And did you follow up on those tips as well? Yes, we did. Did any of those tips ever lead you to finding JJ Ballard? No. Did any of those tips lead you to finding the tiny line? No. Detective, regarding Tylee Ryan and J.J. Vallow, are you aware if a child protection action was filed in Madison County regarding you? Yes, it was. Were you involved with that? I was. I was the one who wrote the affidavit. And what was the purpose of that affidavit? Judge, I'm sorry, I didn't hear what the officer's response is. I was the one who wrote the affidavit. Thank you. You don't want to ask your question? I will ask, but just let me witness in the water. Oh, you should. Uh, Detective, what was the purpose of that affidavit? To get Lori to produce her children to the Rexburg Police Department or the Department of Welfare. And are you aware if there was an order issued in that child protection action? There was. Uh, what did it order? It ordered Lori Vallow to produce her children within five days of being served at court order. <clears throat> Detective, were you ever able to locate Chad Day Bell in one down? Yes, we were. How did you do that? A few different ways. Some of the tips that came in uh, gave us location in Kauai. Also, do your cell phone data. Judge, can I have some foundation as to the time, date, and location? Are there a foundational objection, Mr. Wood? I'll just ask some questions, Your Honor. It's very well. Approximately when did you learn about the location of the Chad Moore? Beginning of January of 2020. And you said it earlier, but I. Uh, what kind of tips gave you that information? Eyewitnesses that would call in that said they saw Lori and Chad on the island of Kauai. And where is Kauai? In Hawaii. Did you ever write warrants uh, to eight or 
apply for warrants to aging and finding Chatham Road. Yes. What, what kind of warrants were those? We wrote warrants for cell phone data, um, geofence location, a few different warrants through cell phone companies to assist us in finding Chatham or your other location. And then, did any of the data you received from those help you locate them? Yes, it did. Seiko, did you ever go to Hawaii as part of your investigation? Yes, I did. And what did you do when you were, when did you get there? I got to Kauai January 24th, 2020. And uh, once you got there, what was the purpose of going there? We went there to aid and assist the Kauai Police Department in serving that court order to produce JJ Tiley to the Rochester Police Department. Uh, and did you see Chad Mori Dado in Kauai? Yes, we did. You mentioned assisting the Kauai Police Department in serving that order. I, what is, are you aware if Lori Ballo was served with that order? Yeah, she was on January 25th, 2019. Uh, while you were in Kauai, did you do anything else? We observed the Kauai Police Department serve two search warrants one on Chad and Lori's condo, and the other on the rental vehicle. Did you perform those searches as well, or just observe the Kauai Police Department do it? No, we just observed and let them serve. Do you recall where their condominium was located in Kauai? Uh, I don't recall the physical address, but it was Princeville. And is that a, a town or city in Kauai? Yes. Um, when you observed the search of the residents they were living in in Princeville, after the Kauai Police Department did their search, were you able to walk through that evidence? Yes, I was. All right. What did you observe at that residence? Everything looked normal. Um, it, it appeared two adults were living there. Um, there were beach towels, two beach towels, everything was, was in pairs. Food in the fridge, couches, everything you see in the door. Did you see JJ Ballard there? No. Or did you see Tyler Ryan there? No. Did you see anything that would have indicated to you that a child was living there? No, I didn't. Did you observe anything that would have indicated to you that a teenager was living there? No. Detective, to your knowledge, did, uh, did Lori Ballo ever produce her children to the Rexford Police Department for the Department of Health and Welfare? No, she didn't. Your Honor, I'm going to ask that the witness be handed State's Exhibit 6. Detective, do you recognize states as it sits? Yes, I do. What does it report to be? It's a photograph of Tyler Ryan. Uh, did you, have, as part of your search, did you uh, look at Tyler Ryan's social media? Yes, we did. Um, to your knowledge, was this image obtained from her social media? It was. It was taken from her Instagram account. And so as part of your search, did you personally observe her Instagram account? Yes, I did. 
And did you personally observe this image on the Instagram? Yes, I did. Is this a true and accurate representation of what you observed on the Instagram? Yes. And and also, as part of your investigation, did you see other pictures of Taiwan? Yes, I did. Um, and is this individual is, is that true and accurate representation of Taiwan? Yes. Your Honor, the state would move for states to six to be entered into evidence. No objection, Judge. Very well. Exhibit six has been offered and admitted without objection. So it's in the record when we publish the tuition support. Thank you. Is this, is this the exhibit we were just speaking of? Yes, it is. <laughs> What was the username on that the account that you put on that picture? Tylee A. Ryan. Okay. And, and this individual is the Tylee Ryan that you came to recognize through your search. That's correct. Right. <laughs> I want to ask you. About the, the phrase proof of life. Are you familiar with that phrase? I am. As a detective, what does that mean to you? Proof of life is any documentation, any video, photograph, anything that we can use to show the last time somebody was saw alive or seen alive. <laughs> Pursuant to your investigation, did you find a last known proof of life for Tyler Ryan? Yes, I did. How did you locate that? That was taken from Lori Valvo's iCloud account. And what? Uh, do you know which iCloud account it was taken from? Lori for style at iCloud.com. And what was the the form of that proof of life. It was a photograph of Tylee taken at uh, West Dillers. Your Honor, I'm going to ask the state or the witness to hand the state's exhibit 29A, 29B, and 13. And I, I believe he's done any by way of stipulation. All right. Judge, that's correct. I'm going to have stipulation. All right. I'll just review those briefly. Then we'll... okay. That would put it sidebar with one switch. Sure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.
be submitted to your witness. And I will note that exhibits 29A and B and exhibit 13 are all admitted without objection. You can proceed, Mr. Williams. Detective, would you look at state's exhibit 13? What does that look like? That is the photograph uh, taken from Warrior Styles, I thought he would testify to or remove Tyler and Ms. Dallas. If I may publish. Yes. You can just identify the individuals in that photograph. Sure. Uh, the little boy is JJ Ballo. The Tyler Ryan is in the middle, and her uncle Alex Cox is on the right. And as, as part of this exhibit, did it contain metadata? Yes, it did. And does the, did the metadata in this is well, can you describe the material what metadata is? Sure. Metadata is, is like a time and date, it has a time and date stamp with the photograph that's taken. So it's just data associated with the photograph. And this this photo was accompanied by metadata? That's correct. And what date was this photograph taken? September 8th, 2019 at 2.49 p.m. And you testified earlier that this was in Yellowstone? Yes. How do you know that that's Yellowstone? I've been there. So you personally recognize that location? Correct. Right. Detective, revisiting this, this idea of proof of life. Um, throughout your investigation, were you ever able to find photographs dated later than that of Kylie Ryan with you? No. I, and can you describe just quickly where you found that photograph? From the iCloud account associated with Lord Bell. And I believe you already said it, but just for purposes of the record, what was the name of that iCloud? Lord for style at iCloud.com. And, and how do you know that that account was associated with Lord Bell? The information attached to it and also the photographs that were attached. And when you say photographs, what type of photographs led you to believe that that was attached to Lord Bell? Family photographs, Lori Vallow's photographs with her in the photos. Detective, pursuant to your investigation, uh, are you aware of a last known proof of life for JJ Bell? Yes, I am. Your Honor, I'm going to ask this uh, the witness be handed states is at 14. I believe also comes in by way of stipulation. From our record, then Mr. Wood, it's been stipulated to and no agreement for this. Is there an objection to the 14 being agreed? No, Judge, it was entered by a stipulation of parties. Very well. Uh, 14 is admitted. Detective, what is State's Exhibit 14? That is a photograph of JJ sitting on a couch in what appears to be the front room of apartment 175. And where did you locate this picture? That was also on Lori for Style, I thought out. And you mentioned 
you believe you recognize the location. I'm sorry, can you say that again? Yes, it appears to be the front room same type of couch that was found in Fort Dallas apartment. Apartment 175. And did this picture have well may I publish a picture if you want? Yeah. Yeah. Can you just describe to the jury what you observed in the state's exhibit number two? That's JJ Vallo sitting on the couch in red pajamas. And did this picture was this picture of the by metadata? It was. Is it is this the metadata that accompanied that picture? Yes. Can you what was the, the date of that picture? September 22nd, 2019. And do you know what time of day it was taken? 11.46 a.m. And just to clarify, what I thought of him was that, was that picture taken from? Also, Lori for style of I thought. So, Detective, you testified earlier that, well, you testified earlier that an order was served on Lori Vallow to produce her children. Correct. And I believe you already testified that she did not produce her children. Correct. Now, what was the next step in your investigation after that? Our next step in that investigation was to reach out to anybody that would possibly know where JJ was. Um, who who would you reach out to? Who reached out to family, uh, the FBI, other agencies, anybody that that would would take our calls, uh, tips that were coming in. Detective, while you were doing this investigation. Uh, were you aware of any investigation in Fremont County regarding Tammy Daybell? Yes. And what did you know? Uh, were you a part of that investigation? I was a part of it, um, but my focus was mainly JJ and Tyler. And what was the investigation in Fremont County regarding? Uh, a suspicious death involving the defendant Daybell's wife. And as part of your investigation, did you know when she had died? Yes. When was that? October 19th of 2019. You testified that your your primary focus was locating Tylee and JJ, correct? That's correct. Your Honor, we just have a very brief slide on it. So, yes.
to make every effort to be concluding trial each day at 3.30, including today. Uh, we are going to take our mid-afternoon break at this time. And just for your reference as well, in case I forget to mention, we'll be going through evidence and testimony again tomorrow, uh, scheduled 8.30 to 3.30. And then with some scheduling issues, we are going to not be holding court on Friday. And so we'll be back on Monday. I just want to make you aware of that schedule as well. So we'll go until 3.30 today, but at this time we will take our break. So if we can try to keep the break to uh, 20 minutes, I appreciate it. With that, uh, I'll apologize for the jury.
Thank you. Please be seated. Council, while we're waiting for the jurors, we will take up on the record at the conclusion of today after jurors can dismiss the issue of further stipulated exhibits, and I'll bring that up before we conclude for the day. All rise in this. Very present and accountable. Very well. Please be seated. All right, we're back on the record after our mid afternoon break. Mr. Wood, if you'd like to continue with the examination of the witness, and all my witnesses, of course, you're still under oath. Mr. Wood. Thank you. And I need to just take up a couple of issues for clarification of the record. Detective, uh, you spoke earlier about searching Lori Vallow's residence. Correct. And then, yeah, you stated the address. What city was that address located in? Richmond. And what state is Richmond in? Oh, yeah. Thank you. Detective, as part of your investigation, did you ever help execute a search warrant on the Daybell on Chad Daybell's residence? Uh, I did. I executed uh, a couple of warrants. Okay. When was the first one? January third of twenty twenty. And Chad Daybell's residence. What county is that located? Madison County. Is what? Well, so, what's his what's his address? 202 North, 1930s. And is, is that, uh, and what city is it listed as? It's, it's listed as, as Rexburg. It's actually in Fremont County, but it's listed there. Okay, so just to be clear, did you just mean misspeak when you said it was in this? I did. I mean, to say it's right. Okay, and it's what county? Fremont County. All right, thank you. Um, and you testified that you did a search there on January 3rd. Correct. Uh, was was that search in aid of another investigative agency? It was. Uh, which agency was that? Fremont County Sheriff's Office. And do you recall what the purpose of that search was for? Uh, I, I don't recall what the probable cause or the reason for the search was at that time. So you didn't write the affidavit? Sir. Did you have any other occasion where you served a search warrant on Chad Daybell residence? Yes, June 9th, 
when you served that warrant on June 9th, 2020, what time did you arrive? Roughly about seven in the morning. Your Honor, I'm going to ask that the witness be handed state's exhibit 10A. Detective, are you familiar with State's Exhibit 10A? Yes, I am. What does it report to be? It's a aerial image uh, taken from Google Earth of the defendant Dayville's property. So, who do you know who prepared that image? I did. Right. I, but you didn't take the picture? No. Yeah. Because it's a satellite photo, correct? Correct. Uh, have you been... I believe you testified you have been to Chad Daybell's residence. Yes. Have you walked around the grounds of Chad Daybell's residence? Yes. And have you been inside his home? I have. Are you familiar with the landmarks of that residence uh, in the yard? Yes, I am. Uh, and are you familiar with uh, you're familiar with the general layout of of the yard and uh, what's located in it? That's correct. And is this is this image an accurate representation of Chad Daybell's residence? Yes. Your Honor, for demonstrative purposes only, the state moves to admit Exhibit 10A. Any objection? Objection. Of what do you mean? Any objection? Right. Uh, officer, uh, approximately how much property are we talking? I couldn't tell you the amount of property. And the prosecuting attorney mentioned the yard. Now, I believe the yard usually means where there's grass. So you're familiar with where the what's on the grass, is that right? I'm not sure I understand your question. Well, there's, and I'll represent to you that there's about four and a half acres out there. Does that sound close to me? Okay. Okay. And I'll represent to you that there's an area that's known as the yard that's a lawn area that you would mow with a lawnmower. Are you following me? Yeah, uh, sure. this is testimonial. No, Judge, I'm trying to, he has, says that he's familiar with the yard. Well, I understand. Uh, I think we're going on to cross examination now, which will be permitted. The question is on an issue of foundation or other objection, whether or not the exhibit is admitted. So, Mr. Pryor, what would be the foundational objection? He has to testify, Judge, that he's familiar with the pasture, three and a half, four acres of property that go beyond the yard. All right, response, Mr. Wood. I think the, uh, the question was accurate. All right, uh, based on foundation and with the testimony of the witness about his knowledge of this property, the court will overrule the foundation objection, allow the exhibit 10 a to be admitted and that you can go into those issues it's quite not cross mr prior thank you thank you your honor i'll publish that show detective so you you testified that you executed your search warrant on june 9 20. correct what time of the day did you arrive at Chad Daybell's residence? Roughly seven in the morning. And I, was it only the rights were police or were there other agencies involved? At that time, there was uh, Fremont County and Rexford City Police that, that went to his house at seven. And did any other agencies help you that day on that search? They did. Who were they? Uh, the FBI, the FBI ERT team, which is an evidence recovery team, the Attorney General's office, 
Fremont County. I believe that that's it. Okay. And you testified you got there about seven o'clock. Yes. So when you first arrived, who was with you? So I do apologize. Could I have a quick sidebar with the council? I'd like to discuss this a little bit briefly.
All right, Mr. Wood, apologies for the court's interruption uh, discussing that last exhibit. You can continue with your direct examination of the witness. Your Honor, could I have the court reporter read back the last question I asked? It's kind of a half question. When you first arrived, who was the question before that was, and you testified you got there about seven o'clock? Answer yes. That's right. Thank you. May I proceed? Yes. Detective, when you arrived around seven o'clock, who, who was with you at that time? There was myself, Lieutenant Rumball at the time, Detective Kaikman, and Detective Bruce Mattingly, and also Detective Dave Stubbs. All right. So can you go back to those individuals and say where they, uh, who they were employed by real quick? Lieutenant Ron Ball with Rexburg Police. Uh, Detective Stubbs is also with Rexburg Police. Uh, Detective Kai Kamani and Matt Ingley are both at the Fremont County Sheriff's Office. And, and just for clarity of the record, is Detective Ball still with the Rexburg Police? No. Okay. And is, and is <clears throat> what organization is he with now? Madison County Sheriff's Office. And Detective Kai Kamani, was he still with Fremont County? No, he's also with the Madison County Sheriff's Office. All right. That's just for clarity. Thank you. So when you got there, what did you do? Initially, we knocked on the front door. We made contact with Mark Daybell, who's the defendant Daybell's son. He answered the door. He was eating a bowl of cereal. It was early in the morning. We informed Mark of why we were there and that we needed to speak with his dad. He stated his dad was still asleep, and we showed him a copy of the warrant, and he proceeded to let us in and show us where his father was. And did you make contact with Mr. Dave at that moment? We did. He showed us that he was sleeping in bedroom above a loft, above the garage. So we walked up the stairs, just a few of us. Uh, Detective Pat and Matt, and we stayed back. Um, we informed Chad that we were there and needed to speak with him. He was still asleep. He asked that we get some clothes on. We allowed him to do that and came downstairs with us. And did you provide a copy of the warrant to Mr. Daybell? We did. And what happened next? Well, Mr. Daybell asked to speak with his attorney. We were standing in the kitchen area. He had a seat in the kitchen. And his attorney at the time was Mark Means. So we allowed him to speak with his attorney. Uh, at that time, Mr. Means wanted to speak with one of the investigators. Judge, I'm going to object at this point. That's, that's fine, Your Honor. We'll stop that. Very well. Um, after Mr. Daybell spoke with his attorney, what was the next step in your, uh, in your portion of the investigation? I allowed Mr. Daybell to sit in the front room. He sat on his recliner closest to the door. His children sat on the couch in the same room. I gave Mr. Daybell a copy of the warrant and he read through search warrant while sitting in his recliner. He asked if he needed to leave the residence while we conducted business. We informed Mr. Daybell he didn't need to leave the residence, but if he chose to stay, he would be accompanied by an officer just for safety purposes. Um, after you had that conversation, what did you do? Mr. Daybell asked if he could make a phone call. Uh, and at that point, he was allowed to go outside and, and make a phone call. I, and where did you go? I went outside with him. Um, and what did you do after that? Mr. Daybell wanted to sit in the vehicle that was parked back in on the west side of the house as a west driveway. Um, so I allowed him to sit inside the vehicle, windows rolled up, and made a phone call. I stood in the grass area close to the vehicle. At this time, Your Honor, I'm going to ask to publish States Exhibit 10A. You may.
Second, do you have that somewhere? Yes, I do. Okay. Can you point out the uh, where the front door of Mr. Daybell's residence is? In that image, or where it would locate? The, there's two doors. Um, I don't know which one Mr. Daybell used as a front door. I can tell you there's a door right here and a door on the back side. Okay. So we were, Mr. Dado was roughly, that's not the vehicle he was in, but it's roughly parked in the same area. And I was standing here in the grassy area. Um, earlier there was some talk about the yard or the grassy area. Can you just outline for the jury where I'm going to call it the grass area of the yard is located on that image? The grass area is right through here. And is, uh, is that a driveway um, behind the house as well? Yes, there's a driveway here. And to the just east of that, what what is that? Is that grass as well? Uh, there was grass here. There's a like a little shop area. There's a shed here, and then this is I guess you would call pasture area. Did you observe any livestock there? No. Detective, um, you testified. If you can show again where Mr. Daybell was and where Miss and where you were in relation to him when he went outside the vehicle. So Mr. Daybell was sitting in a vehicle fairly close to this location. He was sitting in the driver's seat, he was back in. I was standing here just observing Mr. Daybell make the phone call. And did you observe his behavior that uh, while he was making that phone call? I did. Uh, what was what was the nature of his behavior? What was he doing? Initially, he was just on the phone, um, and I was watching him. But as the call progressed, he had the phone in his right hand and was intently looking over his right shoulder. And so I, I found it odd. I wanted to see what he was looking at. So I maneuvered myself to see what he was so intently looking at. And when you did that, did you attempt to orient yourself so that you would be looking in the same direction you perceived him looking at? That's correct. What did you see when you did that? So when the vehicle backed up here, he was looking over his right shoulder in this direction. I stood over here kind of in front towards the roadway to see exactly what he was looking at. And when I looked that way, I saw this area, this pond area. Okay. Now, let's look at that pond real quick. If you can just kind of run the, the pointer around it so the jury's sure where it is. Right here. And there's a, there's a tree right here. Thank you. And then a pond. And when, at the time, you noticed Mr. Dayville looking over there, was there any activity going on over there? There was. So, like I testified, we got there about seven o'clock um, when we made contact with Mr. Daybell and the scene was secure. We radioed for the other units that were staged about a mile and a half down the road that they can come start marking things off with the search warrant. So, as time passed, Mr. Daybell was reading the warrant on his recliner. While he was doing that, there were ERT members and other officers that started marking off different sections in the backyard that we wanted to search. Now, Detective, when, just for clarity of the record and for the jury, I, I believe you defined ERT earlier, but can you uh, tell the jury again what ERT is? Evidence Recovery Team. And, and who are they associated with? With the FBI. Now, Detective, were you the, the lead of this, of, excuse me, executing the search warrant that day? 
I wasn't in charge of the search warrant. So, kind of just, just for clarity again, uh, what did you see when you looked in the direction you thought Mr. Bagel was going to happen? Or I guess, what activity did you see? There were some DRT members marking off a section under this tree, right next to the, on the east side of the pond area. So right in this general location. What did you do next? In, in your part of the search that day? I was tasked with going into the backyard and sifting through what we determined was a fire pit. Can you show the jury on that map or on that picture where the fire pit is located? Um, and you said, I apologize, but for the record, would you have the witness please reference where that point was just from somehow? So there's a oral representation. Yes, detective, if you can point there again and describe what it is you're pointing at, where it is you're pointing. The fire pit area, which there's, there's like a little tree here. It's just to the north of the tree. Yes. Is that a half foot yard? It is. So you said you, you went north of the fire pit. Exactly what did you do? So a few of us were tasked with getting dirt and anything that was in the fire pit and putting it through a sifter. So that's originally what I was tasked to do by the team leader of the PRTP. About what approximately, what time were you doing that? I'd say roughly, probably nine in the morning. That one. Who was the team leader of the ERTP? His name is Steve Daniels. And, and how long did you uh, sit in the fire pit? Uh, I would say probably 35, 45 minutes. And so when you when you sifted, what what kind of what kind of tool did you use to do that? It was a, a wooden sifter. Um, we would scoop shovels full and put it in the sifter and wooden handles you would just shake back and forth. Um, and any larger debris would stay on the top of the wire screen. And did you did you know did you find anything of interest while you were sitting through the fire pit area? Not at that time, no. Did you move to another uh, another area of the search? I did. Um, when, well, when approximately did you do that? You asked for a time. Approximately, yes. Probably. 10 ish, maybe. And uh, why did you? There were ERT members and some other members of law enforcement that had marked off a place under this tree next to the pond. They had called and wanted some other people over there to help with that area. So I left the fire pit area and responded to. This section right here next to the tree and concrete. And what did you observe when you got over there? I observed ERT marking off. Uh, they had already marked off a probably a six by six section. The best way I can describe it is there was taller shrubs um, in the middle of the six by six section. It looked like there was just a little bit of grass, probably the length of sod, and some dirt protruding through the grass, but there were no taller shrubs that are on the outside of the section. Um, what happened next? 
the ERT team began excavating that site. Um, they removed a top layer of soil, took off the shrub and the, um, the top level of dirt. And what did you see under that? At that point, uh, you could see what appeared to be three large white rocks. And as soon as they did that, we could start to smell um, the odor that, through my training experiences, is decomposing blood. Uh, let's talk about that. Um, have you, on other occasions through your work, smelled the decomposing blood? Unfortunately, yes, I have. And is there a distinctive smell to you that, that you associate with that? There is. And it's your testimony that as that first layer of ground was lifted off, you began to smell that. Mm -hmm. That's correct. What did you observe next? After they slowly and methodically dug around the white rocks, they were removed. Um, ERT took pictures and measurements. They continued to dig down right below the layer of rocks or two pieces of thin wood paneling. Just right, right below the, the rocks. Um, were you still able to smell that smell you had described? Yes, as they dug down, it, it got stronger. Were those boards removed? They were. What did you observe after that? So after the boards were removed, you could see the discoloration of dirt. So you had dry dirt, um, and then underneath the boards was like a wet, moist type dirt. So it, it was pretty obvious there, the distinction between the soil. Then what happened? They continued to brush away the, the wet soil, and at that point, you could start to see a black round object start to protrude, protrude through the dirt. And describe that object as about what size was it? Initially, it, it just looked like a, a littler black round object. Um, we dug down further carefully and, and it appeared to take shape of the crown of a human head. What did you do after that or what did you observe once that was uncovered? So once the black round object was uncovered, at that point the ERT team leader Steve Daniels got a small sharp instrument and made a slit in the black plastic. Um, he kind of opened that up just a little bit, not to damage or manipulate any of the evidence. But underneath the black plastic was a, another white layer of plastic. So he used that same instrument and cut a slit down the white plastic and kind of opened it up. And at that point, it looked to be brown human hair. After that was discovered, uh, what happened next? As soon as that was discovered, we received information on the radio that the defendant, Dave Bell, was leaving his daughter's residence, which was Caddy Corner, to his residence at a high rate of speed. At that point, Mr. Dave Bell was pulled over and subsequently placed in custody. Did you go back to uh, the site where the what appeared to be a human head was located? I did. Um, when I got back to what we ended up calling burial site, they continued to excavate um, around that black uh, plastic. 
And after they excavated and took the dirt off the plastic, it revealed um, what appeared to be a small body wrapped in black plastic with duct tape around it. Thank you. Your Honor, I have no time. Yes, it's okay to let's uh, stop the day. All right, we are going to try to adhere to this court schedule. So it is 3.30. This time then, I am going to complete trial for the day. I've got one additional issue I'll take up outside the presence of the jurors. However, the jurors will be excused here momentarily. Uh, as you're leaving for the evening, then, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, as I will try to remember to tell you each and every day or over the breaks, uh, longer breaks, please do not discuss this case amongst yourselves or with anyone else. Please don't do anything to investigate this case. If you see any media coverage of the case, please try to avoid that so you can remain impartial. And with that in mind, uh, that will conclude our first day of evidence. So uh, we'll allow the jurors to please speak at this time. All rise, please. Thank you. Please be seated. I'll detect the two on the other. Step down off the stand. We're going to just argue with this motion. Uh, Council, this isn't necessarily a motion. It's just uh, what I want to get on the record in terms of stipulated evidence the party to have agreed to. I'll note that back on February 27th, the court received a pleading uh, stipulation on introduction of specific evidence. The list contains 74 separate items the parties have determined will be admitted at trial by stipulation. And let me just first uh, begin there and inquire from the state, is this still an accurate representation of evidence that's going to be Proffered and admitted by stipulation to your understanding. To the state's understanding, it is, Your Honor. Okay. And Mr. Pryor, you did uh, review that before it was filed. You signed as well. Is it still your understanding that those listed items on the pleading are not going to be objected to if offered by the defense? And by the state judge, that's correct, yes. Very well. All right, so counsel, I am going to then indicate on the record that those particular items of evidence are to be admitted by stipulation. Uh, the one thing in keeping our record straight is that those are listed out in a one through 74 listing, but those do not correspond with the evidence markings in the case in other words those are not the exhibit numbers or letters that will be admitted in trial so i'll keep the list running but each one of those of course needs to be independently marked and admitted with independent trial uh, stickers so the exhibits are kept straight in the record and our clerk will assist with that as they come in but i assume all of those are going to be pre-marked and admitted and if you wish to reference them on the pleading throughout the trial, you can do that, but you need to make clear that uh, all those exhibits are not, in other words, the pleading does not correspond to the actual exhibit that was on the trial. Is that the state's understanding? Yes, Your Honor. And maybe if I may ask for some clarification from the court. Yes. We do have in here, one of the stipulations covers um, essentially documents that are in relation. If we have a business record affidavit or a custodian of record affidavit, then we would stipulate that the documents covered or the exhibits covered would be admitted. 
does the court want us to introduce those business record affidavits or custodian of record affidavits as their own exhibit? I'll let defense weigh in, but I think that makes the most sense to me. Separate affidavits should be admitted as separate exhibits so those can be tracked down later if someone's referencing the record. Judge, they're stipulated exhibits, so I'll let the prosecutor decide how they want to handle that. Okay. Thank you, Your Honor, because I think at the end of the day, the affidavit itself is stipulated too, but really what matters is the content and documents covered by that affidavit or what's actually going to be admitted as evidence. Okay. So, but we have those if the court would like those admitted as well for the record. Yeah, so they'd be, they'd be separate. The affidavit itself uh, laying foundation for the other exhibits would be a separate exhibit. Yes. To judge, you will note that um, of my 54 exhibits that the state has agreed and stipulated to admit, um, the individual exhibits are the same numbers as the stipulation that we put on the record. So in other words, um, number one on the stipulated uh, list uh, makes mention of some phone cell right information. The actual exhibit itself is the same number that I've been offering. It just happens to be the contents within that phone celebrate. So my numbers match up corresponding to the stipulation that the court has exactly. And I did that for ease of convenience for everyone, Judge. Okay. And if they if they do match, we'll just reference that. If they don't, um, this, I guess the point is the stipulation itself is not any kind of controlling document as to what the exhibits actually will be marked as in the record. So we'll mark each one as it comes in on the record and make clear that uh, this is sim simply a reference, basically, if they correspond to do it, not uh, to clarify that, it should be admitted in terms they're offered as your evidence is introduced. So uh, that will conclude then my concerns on stipulated evidence. Is there anything else we need to know this afternoon before we break for the day from the state? No, Your Honor, thank you. All right, anything further from the defense? Judge, just briefly, the state and I will meet about that issue that we had at uh, the sidebar just the last one to discuss uh, the parameters. Okay, uh, I would suggest counsel will want to start with further testimony at 8.30, so if the parties want to be available at 8 tomorrow morning, we can take up any matters outside the jury's presence before we get the jurors uh, back in the court in the following morning. So that will be our schedule for tomorrow. Okay, thanks everyone in attendance today for complying with the court's conduct order. Uh, you can be excused and we'll be good to all rise, please. Folks, make sure you take all your things with you.